The Library of History by Diodorus Siculus, Book 19. Published in Volume 9 of the Loeb Classical Library Edition, 1947 and Volume 10 of the Loeb Classical Library Edition, 1954. Translated by Russell M. Gear. Digitalized by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Start of Book 19. An old saying has been handed down that it is not men of average ability but those of outstanding superiority who destroy democracies. For this reason some cities, suspecting those of their public men who are the strongest, take away from them their outward show of power. It seems that the step to the enslavement of the fatherland is a short one for men who continue in positions of power, and that it is difficult for those to abstain from monarchy who through eminence have acquired hopes of ruling, for it is natural that men who thirst for greatness should seek their own aggrandizement and cherish desires that know no bounds. The Athenians, for example, exiled the foremost of their citizens for this reason, having established by law what was known among them as ostracism, and this they did, not to inflict punishment for any injustice previously committed, but in order that those citizens who were strong enough to disregard the laws might not get an opportunity to do wrong at the expense of their fatherland. Indeed, they used to recite as an oracle that saying of Solon in which, while foretelling the tyranny of Pisistratus, he inserts this couplet. Destruction cometh upon a city from its great men, and through ignorance the people fall into slavery to a tyrant. More than anywhere else this tendency toward the rule of one man prevailed in Sicily before the Romans became rulers of that island, for the cities, deceived by demagogic wiles, went so far in making the weak strong that these became despots over those whom they had deceived. The most extraordinary instance of all is that of Agathocles who became tyrant of the Syracusans, a man who had the lowest beginnings, but who plunged not only Syracuse but also the whole of Sicily and Libya into the gravest misfortunes. Although, compelled by lack of means and slender fortune, he turned his hand to the potter's trade, he rose to such a peak of power and cruelty that he enslaved the greatest and fairest of all islands, for a time possessed the larger part of Libya and parts of Italy, and filled the cities of Sicily with outrage and slaughter. No one of the tyrants before him brought any such achievements to completion nor yet displayed such cruelty toward those who had become his subjects. For example, he used to punish a private individual by slaughtering all his kindred and to exact reckoning from cities by murdering the people from youth up, and on account of a few who were charged with a crime, he would compel the many, who had done no evil at all, to suffer the same fate, condemning to death the entire population of cities. But since this book embraces all other events as well as the tyranny of Agathocles, we shall forgo preliminary statements about it and set forth the events that follow those already related, stating first the time covered by the account. In the preceding eighteen books we have described to the best of our ability the events that have occurred in the known parts of the inhabited world from the earliest times down to the year before the tyranny of Agathocles, up to which time the years from the destruction of Troy are 866, in this book, beginning with that dynasty. We shall include events up to the battle at Himera between Agathocles and the Carthaginians, embracing a period of seven years. When Demogenes was archon in Athens, the Romans elected to the consulship Lucius Plotius and Manius Fulvius, and Agathocles of Syracuse became tyrant of his city. In order to make clearer the series of events, we shall briefly take up the life of that dynast at an earlier point. Carcinus of Regium, an exile from his native city, settled in Therma in Sicily, a city that had been brought under the rule of the Carthaginians. Having formed a union with a native woman and made her pregnant, he was constantly troubled in his sleep. Being thus made anxious about the begetting of the child, he instructed certain Carthaginian envoys who were setting out for Delphi to ask the god about his expected son. They duly carried out their commission, and an oracle was given forth that the child whom he had begotten would be the cause of great misfortunes to the Carthaginians and to all Sicily. Learning this and being frightened, Carcinus exposed the infant in a public place and set men to watch him that he might die. After some days had passed the child had not died, and those who had been set to watch him began to be negligent. At this time, then, the mother came secretly by night and took the child, and, although, fearing her husband, she did not bring him to her own home, she left him with her brother Heracleides and called him Agathocles, the name of her own father. The boy was brought up in the home of Heracleides and became much fairer in face and stronger in body than was to be expected at his age. 
When the child was seven years old, Carcinus was invited by Heracleides to some festival and, seeing Agathocles playing with some children of his own age, wondered at his beauty and strength. On the woman's remarking that the child who had been exposed would have been of the same age if he had been brought up, he said that he regretted what he had done and began to weep incessantly. Then she, seeing that the desire of the man was in harmony with her own past act, disclosed the entire truth. Gladly hearing her words, he accepted his son, but in fear of the Carthaginians removed to Syracuse with his whole household. Since he was poor, he taught Agathocles the trade of pottery while he was still a boy. At this time Timoleon the Corinthian, after having defeated the Carthaginians in the battle at the Crimesis River, conferred Syracusan citizenship on all who wished. Carcinus was enrolled as a citizen together with Agathocles and died after living only a short time longer. The mother dedicated a stone image of her son in a certain precinct, and a swarm of bees settled upon it and built their honeycomb about its hips. When this prodigy was reported to those who devoted themselves to such matters, all of them declared that at the prime of his life the boy would attain great fame, and this prophecy was fulfilled. A certain Damas, who was counted among the notable men of Syracuse, fell in love with Agathocles and since in the beginning he supplied him lavishly with everything, was the cause of his accumulating a suitable property, and thereafter, when Damas had been elected general against Acragas and one of his Kiliarchs died, he appointed Agathocles in his place. Even before his military service Agathocles had been much respected on account of the great size of his armor, for in military reviews he was in the habit of wearing equipment so heavy that no one of the others was able to use it handily because of the weight of the armor. When he became a chilly arch, he gained even more fame since he was venturesome and daring in battle and bold and ready in haranguing the people. When Damas died of illness and left his property to his wife, Agathocles married her and was counted among the richest men. Thereafter, when the people of Croton were being besieged by the Bridii, the Syracusans sent a strong force to their aid. Antandrus, the brother of Agathocles, was one of the generals of this army, but the commanders of the whole were Heracleides and Sustratus, men who had spent the greater part of their lives in plots, murders, and great impieties, their careers in detail are contained in the book before this one. Agathocles also took part in that campaign with them, having been recognized for his ability by the people and assigned to the rank of Chile Arch. Although he had distinguished himself at first in the battles with the barbarians, he was deprived of the award for his deeds of valor by Sustratus and his friends because of jealousy. Agathocles was deeply offended at them and denounced before the people their resolve to establish an autocratic government. As the people of Syracuse paid no attention to the charges, the cabal of Sustratus did gain control of their native city after the return from Croton. Since Agathocles was hostile to them, he remained at first in Italy with those who made common cause with him. Undertaking to establish himself in Croton, he was driven out and with a few others escaped to Tarentum. While among the Tarentines he was enrolled in the ranks of the mercenaries, and because he took part in many hazardous actions he was suspected of revolutionary designs. When he for this reason was released from this army also, he gathered together the exiles from all parts of Italy and went to the aid of Regium, which was then being attacked by Heracleides and Sustratus. Then when the cabal in Syracuse was brought to an end and the party of Sustratus was expelled, Agathocles returned to his own city. Many citizens of repute had been exiled along with the cabal on the ground that they had been members of the oligarchy of the 600 noblest, and now war arose between these exiles and those who were supporting the democracy. As the Carthaginians became allies of the exiles with Sustratus, there were constant engagements and pitched battles between strong forces, in which Agathocles, sometimes as a private soldier, sometimes appointed to a command, was credited with being energetic and ingenious, for in each emergency he contrived some helpful device. One instance of the kind is well worth mentioning. Once when the Syracusans were in camp near Jela, he stole into the city at night with a thousand men, but Sustratus with a large force in battle array appeared suddenly, routed those who had made their way in, and struck down about three hundred of them. When the remainder tried to escape through a certain narrow passage and had abandoned hope of safety, Agathocles unexpectedly saved them from the danger. Fighting most brilliantly of all, he had received seven wounds, and because of the quantity of blood he had lost, he was weak in body, but when the enemy were upon them, he ordered the trumpeters to go out to the walls on each side and sound the signal for battle. 
When they quickly carried out the order, those who had sallied out from Jela to give aid were not able to learn the truth because of the darkness, but supposing that the remaining force of the Syracusans had broken in on both sides, they abandoned further pursuit, divided their forces into two parts, and went quickly to meet the danger, running toward the sound made by the trumpeters. In this situation Agathocles and his men gained a respite from fighting and came safe to their fortified camp in complete security. Thus on this occasion, by outwitting the enemy in this way, he not only saved his own companions by a miracle but also seven hundred of the allies. Thereafter, at the time when Acestorides the Corinthian had been elected general in Syracuse, Agathocles was reputed to have made an attempt at tyranny, but he escaped from this danger by his own shrewdness. For Acestorides, who was wary of factional strife and therefore was not willing to destroy him openly, ordered him to leave the city and send out men to kill him on the road during the night. But Agathocles, who had shrewdly guessed the intention of the general, selected from his slaves the one who was most like himself in stature and face, and by equipping him with his own armor, horse, and even his own clothing, he deceived those who had been dispatched to kill him. As for himself, he put on rags and by avoiding the roads, completed the journey. They, supposing from the armor and the other indications that it was Agathocles and not observing more closely because of the darkness, accomplished a murder indeed, but failed to carry out the task that had been assigned to them. Afterwards, the Syracusans received back those who had been expelled with Sestratus and made peace with the Carthaginians, but Agathocles as an exile gathered together an army of his own in the interior. After he had become an object of dread not only to his own fellow citizens but also to the Carthaginians, he was persuaded to return to his own city, and at the shrine of Demeter, to which he was taken by the citizens, he swore that he would undertake nothing against the democracy. And it was by pretending to be a supporter of democracy and by winning the favor of the people in artful ways that he secured his own election as general and protector of the peace until such time as real harmony might be established among the exiles who had returned to the city. For it happened that the political clubs of those who were holding meetings were divided into many factions and that important differences of opinion existed among them, but the chief group opposed to Agathocles was the Society of the Six Hundred, which had directed the city in the time of the oligarchy, for the Syracusans who were first in reputation and in property had been enrolled in this society. Agathocles, who was greedy for power, had many advantages for the accomplishment of his design. Not only as general was he in command of the army, but moreover, when news came that some rebels were assembling an army in the interior near Erbida, without rousing suspicion he obtained authority to enroll as soldiers what men he chose. Thus, by feigning a campaign against Erbida he enrolled in the army the men of Morgantina and the other cities of the interior who had previously served with him against the Carthaginians. All these were very firmly attached to Agathocles, having received many benefits from him during the campaigns, but they were unceasingly hostile to the six hundred, who had been magistrates of the oligarchy in Syracuse, and hated the populace in general because they were forced to carry out its orders. These soldiers numbered about three thousand, being both by inclination and by deliberate choice most suitable tools for the overthrow of the democracy. To them, he added those of the citizens who because of poverty and envy were hostile to the pretensions of the powerful. As soon as he had everything ready, he ordered the soldiers to report at daybreak at the Timoleonchum, and he himself summoned Pisarchus and Diocles, who were regarded as the leaders of the Society of the Six Hundred, as if he wished to consult them on some matter of common interest. When they had come bringing with them some forty of their friends, Agathocles, pretending that he himself was being plotted against, arrested all of them, accused them before the soldiers, saying that he was being seized by the six hundred because of his sympathy for the common people, and bewailed his fate. When, however, the mob was aroused and with a shout urged him not to delay but to inflict the just penalty on the wrongdoers out of hand, he gave orders to the trumpeters to give the signal for battle and to the soldiers to kill the guilty persons and to plunder the property of the six hundred and their supporters. All rushed out to take part in the plunder, and the city was filled with confusion and great calamity, for the members of the aristocratic class, not knowing the destruction that had been ordained for them, were dashing out of their homes into the streets in their eagerness to learn the cause of the tumult, and the soldiers, made savage both by greed and by anger, kept killing these men who, in their ignorance of the situation, were presenting their bodies bare of any arms that would protect them. The narrow passages were severally occupied by soldiers, and the victims were murdered, some in the streets, some in their houses. Many, too, against whom there had been no charge whatever, were slain when they sought to learn the cause of the massacre. 
for the armed mob having seized power did not distinguish between friend and foe, but the man from whom it had concluded most profit was to be gained, him it regarded as an enemy. Therefore one could see the whole city filled with outrage, slaughter, and all manner of lawlessness. For some men, because of long-existing hatred, abstained from no form of insult against the objects of their enmity now that they had the opportunity to accomplish whatever seemed to gratify their rage, others, thinking by the slaughter of the wealthy to redress their own poverty, left no means untried for their destruction. Some broke down the doors of houses, others mounted to the house stops on ladders, still others struggled against men who were defending themselves from the roofs, not even to those who fled into the temples did their prayers to the gods bring safety, but reverence to the gods was overthrown by men. In time of peace and in their own city Greeks dared commit these crimes against Greeks, relatives against kinsfolk, respecting neither common humanity nor solemn compacts nor gods, crimes such that there is no one, I do not say no friend, but not even any deadly enemy if he but have a spark of compassion in his soul, who would not pity the fate of the victims. All the gates of the city were closed, and more than four thousand persons were slain on that day whose only crime was to be of gentler birth than the others. Of those who fled, some who rushed for the gates were arrested, while others who cast themselves from the walls escaped to the neighboring cities, some, however, who in panic cast themselves down before they looked, crashed headlong to their doom. The number of those who were driven from their native city was more than six thousand, most of whom fled to the people of Akragas where they were accorded proper care. The party of Agathocles spent the day in the murder of their fellow citizens, nor did they abstain from outrage and crime against women, but they thought that those who had escaped death would be sufficiently punished by the violation of their kindred. For it was reasonable to suppose that the husbands and fathers would suffer something worse than death when they thought of the violence done their wives and the shame inflicted upon their unmarried daughters. We must keep our accounts of these events free from the artificially tragic tone that is habitual with historians, chiefly because of our pity for the victims, but also because no one of our readers has a desire to hear all the details when his own understanding can readily supply them. For men who by day in the streets and throughout the marketplace were bold to butcher those who had done no harm need no writer to set forth what they did at night when by themselves in the homes, and how they conducted themselves toward orphan maidens and toward women who were bereft of any to defend them and had fallen into the absolute power of their direst enemies. As for Agathocles, when two days had passed, since he was now sated with the slaughter of his fellow citizens, after gathering together the prisoners, he let Deinocrates go because of their former friendship, but of the others he killed those who were most bitterly hostile and exiled the rest. Next he called together the assembly and accused the six hundred and the oligarchy that they had brought into existence, saying that he had cleansed the state of those men who were trying to become her masters, and he proclaimed that he was restoring liberty undefiled to the people, and that he wished to be relieved at last of his burdens and become a private citizen on terms of equality with all. As he said this, he tore off his military cloak and, assuming civil garb, set out to leave, showing that he himself was one of the many. But in doing this, he was merely playing the part of a Democrat with full knowledge that the majority of the members of the assembly had had a share in his unholy acts and for this reason would not be willing to vote the generalship to anyone else. At any rate, those who had plundered the property of the victims instantly cried out, begging him not to leave them but to accept the general administration of the state. At first, he maintained silence, then, as the mob pressed more insistently upon him, he said that he accepted the generalship, but that he would not rule jointly with others, for he would not consent as one member of a board to be held legally accountable for acts illegally committed by the others. Since the majority agreed that he should rule alone, he was elected general with absolute power, and thereafter he openly exercised authority and governed the city. Of the Syracusans who were uncorrupted, some were forced to endure in patience because of their fears, and others, outmatched by the mob, did not venture to make an unavailing display of their hostility. On the other hand, many of those who were poor and involved in debt welcomed the revolution, for Agathocles promised in the assembly both to abolish debts and to distribute land to the poor. When he had finished with these matters, he made an end of further slaughter and punishment. With a complete change of humor he showed himself affable to the common people and won no slight popularity by aiding many, by encouraging no small number with promises, and by currying favor from all by philanthropic words. Although he possessed such power, he neither assumed a diadem, nor employed a bodyguard, nor affected a haughty demeanor, as is the custom of almost all tyrants. He kept a careful watch over the public revenues and over the preparation of armor and weapons, and he had warships constructed in addition to those already at hand. 
He also gained control of most of the regions and cities of the interior. This, then, was the situation in Sicily I in Italy the Romans were now in the ninth year of their war with the Samnites. Although in the previous period they had fought with large forces, at this time they accomplished nothing great or worthy of mention by the incursions that they were making upon the hostile territory, yet they did not cease attacking the strongholds and plundering the country. In Apulia, also they plundered all Donia and won back the Canusians, from whom they took hostages. They added two new tribes to those already existing, Falerna and Ufentina. While this was going on, the people of Croton made peace with the Brutii, but they were still waging war against those of their own citizens who had been exiled by the democracy because of their alliance with Heracleides and Sostratus, about which we have told in detail in the preceding book. This war was now in second year, Perrin and Menedemus, both outstanding men, having been elected generals. The exiles, setting out from Thuriae and taking with them 300 mercenaries, tried to enter their native city by night, were driven off by the people of Croton, and encamped on the boundaries of the land of the Brutii. Soon afterwards, however, they were attacked by the army of citizens, which far outnumbered them, and all were slaughtered in the fight. Now that we have finished the affairs of Sicily and Italy, we turn to the remaining parts of Europe. In Macedonia, when Eurydice, who had assumed the administration of the regency, heard that Olympias was making preparations for a return, she sent a courier into the Peloponnesus to Cassander, begging him to come to her aid as soon as possible, and, by plying the most active of the Macedonians with gifts and great promises, she was trying to make them personally loyal to herself. But Polyperkin, with the Asides of Epirus as his ally, collected an army and restored Olympias and the son of Alexander to the throne. So, as soon as he heard that Eurydice was at Euia in Macedonia with her army, he hastened against her with the intention of deciding the campaign in a single battle. When, however, the armies were drawn up facing each other, the Macedonians, out of respect for the position of Olympias and remembering the benefits that they had received from Alexander, changed their allegiance. King Philip with his court was captured at once, while Eurydice was taken as she was making her way to Amphipolis with Polycles, one of her counselors. But after Olympias had thus captured the royal persons and had seized the kingdom without a fight, she did not carry her good fortune as a human being should, but first she placed Eurydice and her husband Philip under guard and began to maltreat them. Indeed, she walled them up in a small space and supplied them with what was necessary through a single narrow opening. But after she had for many days unlawfully treated the unfortunate captives, she ordered certain Thracians to stab Philip to death, who had been king for six years and four months, but she judged that Eurydice, who was expressing herself without restraint and declaring that the kingdom belonged to herself rather than to Olympias, was worthy of greater punishment. She therefore sent to her a sword, a noose, and some hemlock, and ordered her to employ whichever of these she pleased as a means of death, neither displaying any respect whatever for the former dignity of the victim whom she was unlawfully treating, nor moved to pity for the fate that is common to all. Accordingly, when she herself met with a similar reversal, she experienced a death that was worthy of her cruelty. Eurydice, indeed, in the presence of the attendant prayed that like gifts might fall to the lot of Olympias. She next laid out the body of her husband, cleansing its wounds as well as circumstances permitted, then ended her life by hanging herself with her girdle, neither weeping for her own fate nor humbled by the weight of her misfortunes. After these two had been made away with, Olympias killed Nicanor, Cassander's brother, and overturned the tomb of Iolas, avenging, as she said, the death of Alexander. She also selected the hundred most prominent Macedonians from among the friends of Cassander and slaughtered them all. But by glutting her rage with such atrocities, she soon caused many of the Macedonians to hate her ruthlessness, for all of them remembered the words of Antipater, who, as if uttering a prophecy on his deathbed, advised them never to permit a woman to hold first place in the kingdom. This situation, then, in the internal affairs of Macedonia gave clear indication of the impending revolution. In Asia Eumenes with the Macedonian silver shields and their commander Antigenes wintered in the villages of Babylonia known as the villages of the Carians. He sent embassies to Seleucus and Pithon asking them to aid the kings and to join him in the struggle against Antigonus. Of these men, Pithon had been appointed satrap of Media and the other had been named satrap of Babylonia at the time when the second distribution of satrapies was made at Triparadiasis. 
Seleucus said that he was willing to be of service to the kings, but that nevertheless he would never consent to carrying out the orders of Eumenes, whom the Macedonians in assembly had condemned to death. After much discussion in respect to this policy, they sent an ambassador from themselves to Antigenes and the Silver Shields, asking them to remove Eumenes from his command. Since the Macedonians paid no heed to this message, Eumenes, after praising their loyalty, set out with the army and pitched camp on reaching the Tigris River at a distance of 300 stades from Babylon. It was his purpose to direct his course to Susa, where he intended to summon the armies from the upper satrapies and to make use of the royal treasure for his urgent needs. He was forced, however, to cross the river because the country behind him had been plundered, whereas that on the other side was untouched and able to furnish abundant food for his army. When he, accordingly, had gathered boats from all sides for the crossing, Seleucus and Pithon sailed down with two triremes and a good many punts, for these crafts still survived from those that had been built by Alexander near Babylon. Directing these craft to the landing place, Seleucus and Pithon again tried to persuade the Macedonians to remove Eumenes from his command and to cease preferring against their own interests a man who was a foreigner and who had killed very many Macedonians. But when Antigenes and his men were in no way persuaded, Seleucus sailed off to a certain ancient canal and cleared its intake, which had been filled up in the course of time. Since the Macedonian camp was surrounded by water and the neighboring land on all sides was now inundated, there was danger that the entire encamped army would be destroyed by the flood. On that day the Macedonians remained inactive, not knowing how to deal with the situation, but on the next day they brought up the punts, about three hundred in number, and carried the best part of the army across, no one hindering them at the landing, for Seleucus had cavalry only and that too far inferior in number to its opponents. But when night was overtaking them, Eumenes, since he was anxious about the baggage, got the Macedonians back across the river, and under the guidance of one of the inhabitants of the region he began to excavate a certain place through which it was easy to turn the canal and make the neighboring land passable. Seleucus saw this, and since he wished to get them out of his satrapy as soon as possible, he sent envoys to propose a truce, conceding to Eumenes his passage across the river. But at the same time he also sent dispatch carriers into Mesopotamia to Antigonus, asking him to come with his army as soon as possible before the satraps should arrive with their forces. Eumenes, however, after crossing the Tigris and arriving in Susian, divided his army into three parts because of the dearth of food. Marching through the country in separate columns, he was completely without grain, but he distributed to his soldiers rice, sesame, and dates, since the land produced such fruits as these in plenty. He had already sent to the commanders of the upper satrapies the letter from the kings in which it was written that they should obey Eumenes in every way, and at this time he again sent couriers bidding the satraps all to assemble in Susan each with his own army. But it happened that at this very time they had themselves mobilized their forces and had assembled for other reasons, with which it is necessary to deal first. Pithon had been appointed satrap of Media, but when he became general of all the upper satrapies, he put to death Philodas, the former general of Parthia, and set up his own brother Eudamus in his place. At this all the other satraps joined forces, fearing that they might suffer a similar fate since Pithon was seditious and had included great undertakings in his plans. But they got the better of him in a battle, killed many of his supporters, and drove him out of Parthia. At first he withdrew to Media, but after a little he went on to Babylon, where he invited Seleucus to aid him and to share in his expectations. So, since the upper satraps had for this reason concentrated their armies in a single place, the couriers from Eumenes found the forces ready. The most eminent of the commanders and the one who by common consent had assumed command of all the forces was Pusestes, who had been a bodyguard of Alexander and had been promoted by the king because of his courage. He had held the satrapy of Persia for many years and had gained great favor with the inhabitants. They say that for this reason Alexander permitted him alone of the Macedonians to wear the Persian raiment, wishing to please the Persians and believing that through Pusestes he could keep the nation in all respects obedient. At this time Pusestes had ten thousand Persian archers and slingers, three thousand men of every origin equipped for service in the Macedonian array, six hundred Greek and Thracian cavalry, and more than four hundred Persian horsemen. Tlepolemus the Macedonian, who had been appointed satrap of Carmania, had 1,500 foot soldiers and 700 mounted men. Sebertius, the commander of Arachosia, brought 1,000 foot and 610 horse. Androbazus had been dispatched from Peripanicity, of which satrapy Oxyarts was governor, with 1,200 infantry and 400 cavalry. 
Stasander, the satrap of Arya and Drangen, who brought also the troops from Bactrian, had fifteen hundred infantry and a thousand horse. From India came Eudamus, with five hundred horsemen, three hundred footmen, and one hundred and twenty elephants. These beasts he had secured after the death of Alexander by treacherously slaying King Porus. In all, there were assembled with the satraps more than 18,700 infantry and 4,600 cavalry. When the satraps had come into Susan and had joined Eumenes, they called together a general assembly in which there was found to be a good deal of rivalry for the chief command. Pusess thought that because of the number of soldiers who followed him on the campaign and because of his high rank under Alexander he ought to have the supreme command, but Antigenes, who was general of the Silver Shields, said that the right to make the selection ought to be granted to his Macedonians, since they had conquered Asia with Alexander and had been unconquered because of their valor. You means, however, fearing that through their rivalry with each other they would become an easy prey for Antigonus, advised that they should not set up a single commander, but that all the satraps and generals who had been selected by the mass of the army should gather in the royal tent each day and take counsel together about what was to the common advantage. For a tent had been set up for Alexander although he was dead, and in the tent a throne, before which they were accustomed to make offerings and then to sit as a council in regard to matters that demanded attention. Since all approved his proposal as made in the general interest, he called a council each day like that of some city ruling itself on democratic principles. Later, when they arrived at Susa, Eumenes received from those in charge of the treasury a sum of money sufficient for his needs, for it was to him alone that the kings in their letter had ordered the treasurers to give whatever sum he should ask. After paying the Macedonians for six months, he gave two hundred talents to Eudamus, who had brought down the elephants from India, saying that this was for the cost of maintaining the animals, but really trying to win the favor of the man by this gift, for he would tip the scales decisively in favor of any one of the rivals to whom he might attach himself, since the employment of the beast strikes terror. Each of the other satraps provided for the support of the troops who had followed him from the territory under his command. While Eumenes remained in Susan refreshing his forces, Antigonus, who had wintered in Mesopotamia, at first had planned to follow Eumenes close on his heels before his strength should be increased, but on hearing that the satraps and their armies had joined the Macedonians, he checked his speed and began to refresh his forces and to enroll additional soldiers, for he perceived that the war called for large armies and for no ordinary preparation. While these things were happening, Attalus, Polmon, and Docimus, together with Antipater and Philodas, the commanders who had been captured along with the army of Alcides, were being kept under guard in a certain exceedingly strong fortress, but when they heard that Antigonus was leading his expedition into the upper satrapies, believing that they had a favorable opportunity, they persuaded certain of their custodians to release them, and then, gaining possession of arms, they set upon the guard at about midnight. They themselves numbered only eight and were guarded by four hundred soldiers, but they excelled in daring and dexterity, thanks to their service with Alexander. They laid violent hands upon Xenopetes, the captain of the garrison, and threw him from the wall at a point where the cliff was six hundred feet high, and then, after slaughtering some of the remaining guards and casting the others down, they set fire to the buildings. From those who had been standing aside to observe the outcome they increased their number to fifty. Since the stronghold held a large amount of grain and other provisions, they took counsel together whether they ought to remain and take advantage of the strength of the position, awaiting the aid to be expected from Eumenes, or should flee as quickly as possible and move about the country while waiting for a change in the situation. There was a considerable argument, for Docimus advised flight, while Attalus declared that he would not be able to endure hardship because of the bad physical condition that had been caused by his imprisonment. But while they were disputing with each other, troops had already assembled from the adjacent fortresses, more than 500 foot soldiers and 400 horsemen, and in addition, others had come from the native peoples, men of every kind to a number exceeding 3,000, who had selected a commander from their own ranks and encamped about the stronghold. When they had unexpectedly been shut in again, Docimus, who had learned that a certain way of descent was unguarded, sent an ambassador to Antigonus' wife Stratonus, who was in the neighborhood. When he and one companion escaped by arrangement with her, he was accorded no confidence but was handed over to a guard, and the man who had gone out with him became a guide for the enemy, conducted a considerable number of them into the stronghold, and occupied one of the peaks. Although the followers of Attalus were far outnumbered, their courage enabled them to hold their ground, and keeping up the fight day after day they resisted stubbornly, only after they had been besieged for a year and four months were they taken by assault. 
When Democlides was archon at Athens, the Romans elected Gaius Junius and Quintus Emilius consuls. This was the 116th celebration of the Olympic Games, at which Danamines the Laconian won the footrace. At this time Antigonus set out from Mesopotamia and came into Babylonia, where he made an agreement for common action with Seleucus and Pithon. He received soldiers from them also, made a pontoon bridge over the Tigris River, took his army across, and set out against the enemy. When Eumenes learned what had taken place, he ordered Xenophilus, who was guarding the citadel of Susa, not to give any of the money to Antigonus nor to have any conference with him. Eumenes himself with his forces set out for the Tigris River, which is a day's march from Susa at the place where it flows out of the mountainous country that is occupied by the unconquered tribesmen called the Uxii. Its width in many places is three stades, and in some places even four, and in the middle of the stream the depth is about the height of an elephant. After flowing along for some 700 stades from the mountains, it empties into the Red Sea, and it contains abundant saltwater fishes as well as sharks, which appear just about the time of the rising of the Dog Star. Keeping this river in front of them as a protection and holding the bank from its source to the sea with pickets, they awaited the onset of the enemy. Since this guard, because of its length, required no small number of soldiers, Eumenes and Antigenes requested Pusess to summon 10,000 bowmen from Persia. At first, he paid no heed to them, since he still bore a grudge for not having received the generalship, but later, reasoning with himself, he admitted that should Antigonus be victorious the result would be that he himself would lose his satrapy and also be in danger of his life. In his anxiety, therefore, about himself, and thinking also that he would be more likely to gain the command if he had as many soldiers as possible, he brought up ten thousand bowmen as they requested. Although some of the Persians were distant a thirty days' journey, they all received the order on that very day, thanks to the skillful arrangement of the posts of the guard, a matter that it is not well to pass over in silence. Persia is cut by many narrow valleys and has many lookout posts that are high and close together, on which those of the inhabitants who had the loudest voices had been stationed. Since these posts were separated from each other by the distance at which a man's voice can be heard, those who received the order passed it on in the same way to the next, and then these in turn to others until the message had been delivered at the border of the satrapy. While Eumenes and Pusess were engaged in these matters, Antigonus advanced with his army and came to Susa, the capital. He appointed Seleucus satrap of that country, gave him troops, and ordered him to lay siege to the citadel, since the treasurer, Xenophilus, refused to accept his orders. He himself with his army broke camp and set out against the enemy although the road was very hot and very dangerous for a foreign army to traverse. For this reason they were forced to march at night and make camp near the river before sunrise. Nevertheless, he was not able to escape altogether untouched by the hardships characteristic of the country, although he did everything in his power, he lost a large number of men because of the extreme heat, for it was in fact the season when the dog star rises. When he reached the Coprates River, he began to make preparations for crossing. This river, running from a certain mountainous region, enters the Paz Tigris, which was at a distance of about 80 stades from Eumenes' camp. It is about four plethora in width, but since it is swift in current, it required boats or a bridge. Seizing a few punts, he sent some of the infantry across in them, ordering them to dig a moat and build a palisade in front of it, and to receive the rest of the army. But as soon as Eumenes heard from scouts of the enemy's move, he crossed the pontoon bridge over the Tigris with 4,000 foot soldiers and 1,300 horsemen and surprised the soldiers of Antigonus who had crossed, more than 3,000 foot soldiers, 400 cavalry, and not less than 6,000 of those soldiers who were in the habit of crossing in scattered groups in search of forage. Falling suddenly upon them while they were in disorder, Eumenes routed the rest of them at once, and those of the Macedonians who resisted he overcame by his onset and by weight of numbers and compelled them all to flee to the river. They all rushed to the boats, but these were submerged by the great number of the men who embarked, and most of those who ventured to swim were carried away by the current and drowned, only a few getting safely over. Those who did not know how to swim, preferring captivity to death in the river, were taken prisoners to the number of four thousand. Antigonus, although he saw that great number being destroyed, could not go to their aid on account of his lack of boats. Believing that the crossing was impossible, Antigonus set out toward the city of Badas, which is situated on the bank of the Elias River. Since the march was scorching hot because of the intensity of the sun's rays, many soldiers perished, and the army became discouraged. 
Nevertheless, after staying in the above-mentioned city for a few days and letting the army recover from its sufferings, he decided that the best course was to march to Ekbatna in Media and with that as a base to gain control of the upper satrapies. There were two roads leading into Media, each having a disadvantage. The road leading to Cologne was a good royal highway, but it was hot and long, extending for almost forty days' march, while the other, which passed through the Cassian tribes, was difficult and narrow, skirting precipices and passing through enemy territory, and moreover lacking in supplies, but it was short and cool. It is not easy for an army to follow this route without having gained the consent of the tribesmen who inhabited the mountain ranges. These men, who have been independent from ancient times, live in caves, eating acorns and mushrooms, and also the smoked flesh of wild beasts. Since Antigonus regarded it as beneath his dignity to use persuasion on these people or to make them presents, when he had so great an army following him, he selected the finest of the peltas and divided the bowmen, the slingers, and the other light-armed troops into two bodies, one of which he gave to Nearchus, ordering him to go on ahead and occupy in advance the places that were narrow and difficult. After arranging the other group along the entire line of march, he himself advanced with the phalanx, putting Pithon in command of the rear guard. Now Nearchus' detachment going on ahead occupied a few of the lookouts, but since they were too late in the case of most of them and those the most important, they lost many men and barely made their way through with the barbarians pressing hard upon them. As for the troops led by Antigonus, whenever they came to these difficult passes, they fell into dangers in which no aid could reach them. For the natives, who were familiar with the region and had occupied the heights in advance, kept rolling great rocks in quick succession upon the marching troops, and at the same time, sending arrows thick and fast, they wounded men who were able neither to turn aside the missiles nor to avoid them because of the difficulties of the terrain. Since the road was precipitous and nearly impassable, the elephants, the cavalry, and even the heavy-armed soldiers found themselves forced at the same time to face death and to toil hard, without being able to help themselves. Caught in such toils, Antigonus regretted that he had not heeded Pithon when he advised him to purchase the right of passage with money. Nevertheless, after losing many men and endangering the entire undertaking, he came with difficulty on the ninth day safe into the settled part of Media. The soldiers of Antigonus, however, because of the continuous misfortunes and their own extreme misery, became so critical of him that they let fall hostile remarks, for in forty days they had met with three great disasters. Nevertheless, by mingling with the soldiers on friendly terms and by making ready an abundant supply of all provisions, he restored the army from its miserable state. He sent Pithon out, ordering him to go through all media and gather as many horsemen and war horses as he could, and also a quantity of baggage animals. As that land always abounds in four-footed beasts, Pithon readily accomplished his mission and returned bringing two thousand horsemen, more than a thousand horses with their trappings, a sufficient number of beasts of burden to equip the entire army, and in addition to this, five hundred talents of the royal treasure. Antigonus organized the horsemen in troops, and by giving horses to men who had lost their own and by distributing most of the pack animals as presents, he regained the goodwill of the soldiers. When the satraps and generals with Eumenes learned that the enemy was encamped in Media, they disagreed among themselves, for Eumenes, Antigenes, who commanded the silver shields, and all those who had made the march up from the sea, believed that they should go back to the coast, but those who had come down from the satrapies, anxious about their own private affairs, asserted that it was essential to maintain control of the upper country. As the disagreement became more violent, you means, seeing that if the army should be divided neither part would be capable of fighting by itself, deferred to the wishes of the satraps who had come from the interior. Leaving the Paz of Tigris, accordingly, they proceeded to Persepolis, the capital of Persia, a march of twenty-four days. The first part of the road as far as the so-called ladder was through an enclosed valley, torrid and lacking in provisions, but the rest was over high land, blessed with a very healthful climate and full of the fruits appropriate to the season. For there were glens heavily overgrown and shady, cultivated trees of various kinds in parks, also natural converging glades full of trees of every sort and streams of water, so that travelers lingered with delight in places pleasantly inviting repose. Also, there was an abundance of cattle of every kind, which Pusests gathered together from the inhabitants and distributed without stint to the soldiers, seeking their goodwill. But those who inhabited this country were the most warlike of the Persians, every man being a bowman and a slinger, and in density of population, too, this country far surpassed the other satrapies. 
When they had arrived in Persepolis, the capital, Pusestes, who was general of this land, performed a magnificent sacrifice to the gods and to Alexander and Philip, and, after gathering from almost the whole of Persia a multitude of sacrificial animals and of whatever else was needed for festivities and religious gatherings, he gave a feast to the army. With the company of those participating, he filled four circles, one within the other, with the largest circle enclosing the others. The circuit of the outer ring was of ten stades and was filled with the mercenaries and the mass of the allies, the circuit of the second was of eight stades, and in it were the Macedonian silver shields and those of the companions who had fought under Alexander, the circuit of the next was of four stades and its area was filled with reclining men, the commanders of lower rank, the friends and generals who were unassigned, and the cavalry, lastly in the inner circle with a perimeter of two. States each of the generals and hipparchs and also each of the Persians who was most highly honored occupied his own couch. In the middle of these there were altars for the gods and for Alexander and Philip. The couches were formed of heaps of leaves covered by hangings and rugs of every kind, since Persia furnished in plenty everything needed for luxury and enjoyment, and the circles were sufficiently separated from each other so that the banqueter should not be crowded and that all the provisions should be near at hand. While all were being duly served, the crowd applauded the generosity of Pusestes, and it was clear that he had made a great advance in popularity. But you means, seeing this and reasoning that Pusestes was playing up to the crowd in furtherance of his desire for the chief command, had fabricated a false letter, through which he made the soldiers confident of the outcome of the battles and, by lowering the pomp and circumstance of Pusestes, improved his own standing and increased his prospects of success in the eyes of the crowd. The purport of what he had written was that Olympias, associating Alexander's son with herself, had recovered firm control of the kingdom of Macedonia after slaying Cassander, and that Polyperchon had crossed into Asia against Antigonus with the strongest part of the royal army and the elephants and was already advancing in the neighborhood of Cappadocia. The letter, written in the Syrian writing, was sent from Orontes, who held the satrapy of Armenia and who was a friend of Pusestes. Since the letter was believed because of the previous friendship between the satraps, you means ordered it to be carried around and shown to the commanders and also to most of the other soldiers. The sentiment of the entire encampment was changed and all began to turn their attention to you means prospects in the belief that he would be able by help of the kings both to promote whomever he wished and to exact punishment from those who wronged him. After the feast you means, in his desire to overawe those who did not obey him or who craved a command, brought to trial Sabertius, who was satrap of Aracosia and a very close friend of Pusestes. Without Sabertius' knowledge, you means sent some horsemen into Aracosia, and by ordering the seizure of his baggage, he brought him into such danger that, if he had not escaped secretly, he would have been condemned to death by the assembly. After Eumenes had frightened the others in this manner and had surrounded himself with pomp and circumstance, he changed once more and, having won Pusess over with kind words and great promises, rendered him loyal toward himself and eager to join in the struggle in behalf of the kings. Desiring to exact from the other satraps and generals hostages, as it were, to prevent their deserting him, he pretended to be in need of money and called on each of them to lend all the money he could to the kings. By taking four hundred talents from those leaders from whom he considered it expedient, he converted men whom he had formerly suspected of plotting against him or of intending to abandon him into most faithful guards of his person and partners in the contest. While Eumenes was making these strategic moves with an eye to the future, there came men from Media with information that Antigonus and his army had broken camp and set out for Persia. When he heard this, he also set out, having made up his mind to meet the enemy and risk the issue. On the second day of the journey he performed a sacrifice to the gods and entertained the army sumptuously, the large majority he had indeed encouraged to loyalty, but he himself during the drinking bout was led on by those of the invited guests who were eagerly engaged in drinking, and he became ill. For this reason he delayed the march for some days, since he was overcome by his ailment, and the army was disheartened, for the enemy were expected to engage them shortly and the ablest of their generals was handicapped by his illness. Nevertheless, when the attack had passed its crisis and he had recovered a little, Eumenes advanced with the army, which Pusestes and Antigenes were leading, while he himself, carried in a litter, followed the rear guard so that he might not be disturbed by the confusion and the congestion of the road. When the armies were a day's march from each other, they both sent scouts, and after learning the size and the intentions of the enemy, they both made ready for the fray, but they separated without a battle, for each had drawn up his army with a river and a ravine in front of him, and because of the difficulty of the terrain they were not able to come to blows. 
the armies, encamped at a distance of three states from each other for four days, continued to skirmish and to plunder the country, for they were entirely without supplies, but on the fifth day Antigonus sent envoys to the satraps and the Macedonians, urging them not to obey Eumenes, but to put trust in himself. He said that he would allow the satraps to keep their own satrapies, that to some of the Macedonians he would give a large gift of land, would send back others to their homes with honors and gifts, and would assign to appropriate posts those who wished to serve in his army. When, however, the Macedonians paid no heed to these offers and even threatened the envoys, Eumenes came forward and praised them and told them a tale, one of the traditional time-worn stories it is true, but one not unsuited to the situation. He said that a lion, having fallen in love with a maiden, spoke to the girl's father about marriage. The father said that he was ready to give her to him, but that he was afraid of the lion's claws and teeth, fearing that after he had married her he might lose his temper about something and turn on the maiden in the manner of a beast. When, however, the lion had pulled out his claws and his teeth, the father, perceiving that the lion had thrown away everything which had made him formidable, killed him easily with a club. It is this same sort of thing, he added, that Antigonus is doing now, he will only keep his promises until he becomes master of the army, and in that very moment will execute its leaders. While the crowd was shouting approval and saying right, he dismissed the assembly. That night, however, there appeared certain deserters from Antigonus' army with the report that Antigonus had given his soldiers orders to break camp at about the second watch. Eumenes, on considering the matter, concluded rightly that the enemy intended to withdraw into Gabin, as this place, distant about three days' march, was unplundered and filled with grain, fodder, and in general with that which could amply supply the provisions for a great army. Furthermore, the terrain itself supplemented these advantages, since it had rivers and ravines that were hard to cross. Being anxious, therefore, to occupy this place before the enemy, he imitated him. He caused certain mercenaries, whose consent he had won by money, to go away as if they were deserting, ordering them to say that Eumenes had decided to attack the camp during that night. He himself, however, sent the baggage on ahead and ordered the soldiers to break camp after having taken a very hasty meal. When all this had been swiftly accomplished, Antigonus, who had heard from the deserters that the enemy had decided to fight during the night, postponed his departure and drew up his forces for the battle. While he was distracted by these operations and concentrating on the coming battle, he failed to notice that Eumenes had got the start of him and was marching at top speed for Gabin. For some time Antigonus kept his army under arms, but when he learned from his scouts that his opponent had departed, although he knew that he had been outgeneraled, nonetheless he held to his original purpose. So, ordering his soldiers to break camp, he led them on a forced march that resembled a pursuit. Eumenes, however, had a start of two watches, therefore Antigonus, knowing that it was not easy to overtake with his whole army a force that was so far ahead, devised a stratagem as follows. He gave the rest of the army to Pithon and ordered him to follow at leisure, but he himself with the cavalry pursued at top speed, and overtaking the rearguard of the enemy at daybreak, just as it was coming down from some hilly country, he took position on the ridges, where he was visible to the enemy. When Eumenes from a considerable distance beheld cavalry of the enemy and supposed that the entire army was near, he halted the march and drew up his army on the assumption that there would be an engagement immediately. Thus in the manner described the generals of the two armies each outwitted the other as if they were taking part in a preliminary contest of skill and showing that each placed his hope of victory in himself. In any case, Antigonus by this device prevented the enemy from going forward while securing for himself a respite in which to bring up his army, and then when the army arrived, he drew it all up for battle and marched down an awe-inspiring array against the enemy. Including reinforcements brought by Pithon and Seleucus, Antigonus had in all more than 28,000 foot soldiers, 8,500 horsemen, and 65 elephants. The generals employed different formations in drawing up the armies, vying with each other in regard to their competence in tactical skill as well. On his left wing Eumenes stationed Eudamus, who had brought the elephants from India, with his squadron of 150 horsemen, and as an advance guard for them two troops of selected mounted lancers with a strength of 50 horsemen. He placed them in contact with the higher land of the base of the hill, and next to them he puts to Sander, the general, who had his own cavalry to the number of 950. 
After them he stationed Amphimachus, the satrap of Mesopotamia, whom six hundred horsemen followed, and in contact with these were the six hundred horsemen from Arachosia, whose leader formerly had been Sebertius, but, because of the latter's flight, Cephalon had assumed command of them. Next were five hundred from Peripanicity and an equal number of Thracians from the colonies of the upper country. In front of all these he drew up forty-five elephants in a curved line with a suitable number of bowmen and slingers in the spaces between the animals. When Eumenes had made the left wing strong in this way, he placed the phalanx beside it. The outer end of this consisted of the mercenaries, who numbered more than six thousand, next were about five thousand men who had been equipped in the Macedonian fashion although they were of all races. After them he drew up the Macedonian silver shields, more than three thousand in number, undefeated troops, the fame of whose exploits caused much fear among the enemy, and finally the men from the Hypaspists, more than three thousand, with Antigenes and Tatamus leading both them and the silver shields. In front of the whole phalanx he placed forty elephants, filling the spaces between them with light-armed soldiers. On the right wing he stationed cavalry, next to the phalanx, eight hundred from Carmania led by the satrap Tepolemus, then the nine hundred called the Companions and the squadron of Pusests and Antigenes, which contained three hundred horsemen arranged in a single unit. At the outer end of the wing was Eumene's squadron with the same number of horsemen, and as an advance guard for them two troops of Eumene slaves, each composed of fifty mounted men, while at an angle beyond the end of the wing and guarding it were four troops, in which there were two hundred selected horsemen. In addition to these, three hundred men selected from all the cavalry commands for swiftness and strength were stationed by Eumenes behind his own squadron. Along the whole of the wing he drew up forty elephants. The entire army of Eumenes consisted of thirty-five thousand foot soldiers, sixty-one hundred horsemen, and one hundred and fourteen elephants. As Antigonus looked down from a high position, he saw the battle line of his enemy and disposed his own army accordingly. Seeing that the right wing of the enemy had been strengthened with the elephants and the strongest of the cavalry, he arrayed against it the lightest of his horsemen, who, drawn up in open order, were to avoid a frontal action but maintain a battle of wheeling tactics and in this way thwart that part of the enemy's forces in which they had the greatest confidence. On this wing he stationed the mounted archers and lancers from Media and Parthia, a thousand in number, men well trained in the execution of the wheeling movement, and next he placed the twenty-two hundred Tarentines who had come up with him from the sea, men selected for their skill in ambushing, and very well disposed to himself, the thousand cavalry from Phrygia and Lydia, the fifteen hundred with Pithon, the four hundred lancers with Lysanias, and in addition to all these, the cavalry who are called the two horsemen and the eight hundred cavalry from the colonists established in the upper country. The left wing was made up of these cavalrymen, all of whom were under the command of Pithon. Of the infantry, more than nine thousand mercenaries were placed first, next to them three thousand Lycians and Pamphylians, then more than eight thousand mixed troops in Macedonian equipment, and finally the nearly eight thousand Macedonians, whom Antipater had given him at the time when he was appointed regent of the kingdom. The first of the horsemen on the right wing adjacent to the phalanx were five hundred mercenaries of mixed origin, then a thousand Thracians, five hundred from the allies, and next to them the thousand known as the companions with Antigonus' son Demetrius as commander, now about to fight in company with his father for the first time. At the outer end of the wing was the squadron of three hundred horsemen with whom Antigonus himself was entering the battle. As an advance guard for these there were three troops from his own slaves, and parallel to them were as many units reinforced by a hundred Tarentines. Along the whole wing he drew up the strongest thirty of the elephants, making a curved line, and he filled the interval between them with selected light-armed men. Most of the other elephants he placed before the phalanx, but a few were with the cavalry on the left wing. When he had drawn up the army in this fashion, he advanced down the hill against the enemy keeping an oblique front, for he thrust forward the right wing, in which he had most confidence, and held the left back, having determined to avoid battle with the one and to decide the contest with the other. When the armies were close to each other and the signal had been raised in each of them, the troops shouted the battle cry alternately several times and the trumpeters gave the signal for battle. First Pithon's cavalry, who had no stability or any advance guard worth mentioning yet were superior to those arrayed against them in numbers and in mobility, began trying to make use of their own advantages. 
They did not consider it safe to make a frontal attack against elephants, yet by riding out around the wing and making an attack on the flanks, they kept inflicting wounds with repeated flights of arrows, suffering no harm themselves because of their mobility but causing great damage to the beasts, which because of their weight could neither pursue nor retire when the occasion demanded. When you means, however, observed that the wing was hard pressed by the multitude of mounted archers, he summoned the most lightly equipped of his cavalry from Eudamus, who had the left wing. Leading the whole squadron in a flanking movement, he made an attack upon his opponents with light-armed soldiers and the most lightly equipped of the cavalry. Since the elephants also followed, he easily routed the forces of Pithon and pursued them to the foothills. At the same time that this was going on, it so happened that the infantry for a considerable time had been engaged in a battle of phalanxes, but finally, after many had fallen on both sides, Eumene's men were victorious because of the valor of the Macedonian silver shields. These warriors were already well on in years, but because of the great number of battles they had fought they were outstanding in hardihood and skill, so that no one confronting them was able to withstand their might. Therefore, although there were then only three thousand of them, they had become, so to speak, the spearhead of the whole army. Although Antigonus saw that his own left wing had been put to flight and that the entire phalanx had been defeated, he did not heed those who advised him to retire to the mountains and furnish a rallying point for those who escaped from the rout, while keeping the part of the army under his immediate command an unbroken unit, but rather, by cleverly taking advantage of the opportunities offered by the situation, he both saved the fugitives and gained the victory. For as soon as Eumene's silver shields and the remaining body of his infantry had routed those who opposed them, they pursued them as far as the nearer hills, but Antigonus, now that a break was thus caused in the line of his enemy, charged through with a detachment of cavalry, striking on the flank the troops who had been stationed with Eudamus on the left wing. Because the attack was unexpected, he quickly put to flight those who faced him, destroying many of them, then he sent out the swiftest of his mounted men and by means of them he assembled those of his soldiers who were fleeing and once more formed them into a line along the foothills. As soon as Eumenes learned of the defeat of his own soldiers he recalled the pursuers by a trumpet signal, for he was eager to aid Eudamus. Although it was already lamplighting time, both rallied their fleeing troops and began to put their entire forces in battle or once more, such zeal for victory filled not only the generals but also the mass of the contestants. Since the night was clear and lighted by a full moon and the armies were forming parallel to each other at a distance of about four plethora, the clatter of arms and the snorting of the horses seemed close at hand to all the contestants. But as they were moving from column into line, being distant about thirty states from those who had fallen in the battle, the hour of midnight overtook them, and both armies were so exhausted by marching, by their suffering in the battle, and by lack of food, that they were forced to give up the battle and go into camp. Eumenes undertook to march back to the dead, desiring to control the disposal of the bodies and to put his claim to victory beyond dispute. When, however, the soldiers would not listen to him, insisting with shouts that they return to their own baggage train, which was some distance away, he was forced to yield to the majority, for he was not able to punish the soldiers severely when there were many who disputed his right to command, and he saw that the time was not suitable for chastising those who disobeyed. On the other hand, Antigonus, who firmly held the command without need of courting popular favor, forced his army to make camp by the bodies, and since he gained control of their burial, he claimed the victory, declaring that to possess the fallen is to be victorious in battle. In this battle 3,700 foot and 54 horse from the army of Antigonus were slain and more than 4,000 men were wounded, 540 of Eumene's infantry and very few of his cavalry fell, and the wounded were more than 900. When after leaving the battle Antigonus saw that his men were disheartened, he decided to move as far as possible from the enemy with the utmost speed. Wishing to have the army unencumbered for the retirement, he sent the wounded men and the heaviest part of the baggage ahead to one of the neighboring cities. He began to bury the dead at dawn and detained the herald who had come from the enemy to treat for the recovery of the bodies, and he ordered his men to eat dinner at once. When the day had passed, he sent the herald back, assigning the removal of the bodies to the next morning, but he himself at the beginning of the first watch broke camp with the whole army, and by making forced marches withdrew a long distance from the enemy and gained an unplundered country in which to refresh his soldiers. He went, indeed, as far as Gamarga in Media, a land that was subject to Pithon and that was able to supply great armies abundantly with everything needed for their support. 
When Yumin's learned through scouts of the departure of Antigonus, he refrained from following him because his own soldiers also had lacked food and had suffered great hardship, but he attended to the taking up of the dead and saw to it that they received a magnificent burial. Then an event took place that was amazing and very different from Greek custom. Cedius, the general of the soldiers who had come from India, was killed in the battle after fighting brilliantly, but he left two wives who had accompanied him in the army, one of them a bride, the other married to him some years before, but both of them loving him deeply. It is an ancient custom among the Indians that the men who marry and the maidens who are married do not do so as a result of the decision of their parents, but by mutual persuasion. Formerly, since the wooing was done by persons who were too young, it often happened that, the choice turning out badly, both would quickly regret their act, and that many wives were first seduced, then through wantonness gave their love to other men, and finally, not being able without disgrace to leave the mates whom they had first selected, would kill their husbands by poison. The country, indeed, furnished no few means for this, since it produced many and very deadly poisons, some of which when merely spread upon the food or the wine cups caused death. But when this evil became fashionable and many were murdered in this way, the Indians, although they punished those guilty of the crime, since they were not able to deter the others from wrongdoing, established a law that wives, except such as were pregnant or had children, should be cremated along with their deceased husbands, and that one who was not willing to obey this law should not only be a widow for life, but also be entirely debarred from sacrifices and other religious observances as unclean. When these laws had been established, the lawlessness of the women changed into the opposite, for as each one, because of the great loss of caste willingly met death, they not only cared for the safety of their husbands as if it were their own, but they even vied with each other as for a very great honor. Such rivalry appeared on this occasion. Although the law ordered only one of Cedius' wives to be cremated with him, both of them appeared at his funeral, contending for the right of dying with him as for a prize of valor. When the generals undertook to decide the matter, the younger wife claimed that the other was pregnant and for that reason could not take advantage of the law, and the elder asserted that more justly should the one who had the precedence in years have precedence in honor, for in all other matters those who are older are regarded as having great precedence over the younger in respect and honor. The generals, ascertaining from those skilled in midwifery that the elder was pregnant, decided for the younger. When this happened, the one who had lost the decision departed weeping, rending the wreath that was about her head and tearing her hair, just as if some great disaster had been announced to her, but the other, rejoicing in her victory, went off to the pyre crowned with fillets that her maidservants bound upon her head, and magnificently dressed as if for a wedding she was escorted by her kinsfolk, who sang a hymn in honor of her virtue. As she drew near the pyre, she stripped off her ornaments and gave them to her servants and friends, leaving keepsakes, as one might say, to those who loved her. These were the ornaments, upon her hands a number of rings set with precious stones of various colors, about her head no small number of golden stars interspersed with stones of every kind, and about her neck numerous necklaces, some of them smaller, the others each a little larger in a constant progression. Finally, after taking leave of the household, she was assisted to mount the pyre by her brother, and while the multitude that had gathered for the spectacle watched with amazement, she ended her life in heroic fashion. For the entire army under arms marched three times about the pyre before it was lighted, and she herself, reclining beside her husband and letting no ignoble cry escape her during the onset of the fire, stirred some of those who beheld her to pity, others to extravagant praise. Nevertheless, some of the Greeks denounced the custom as barbarous and cruel. When Eumenes had completed the burial of the dead, he moved the army from among the Paradisini into Gabine, which was unplundered and capable of supplying everything in abundance for the armies. It happened that this country was a twenty-five days' march from Antigonus if one went through inhabited country, but if one went through waterless desert, a march of nine days. In these regions, and at this distance from each other Eumenes and Antigonus passed the winter and at the same time refreshed their men. In Europe, when Cassander, who was besieging Tegea in the Peloponnesus, learned of the return of Olympias to Macedonia and of the murder of Eurydice and King Philip, and moreover what had befallen the tomb of his brother Iolas, he came to terms with the people of Tegea and set out for Macedonia with his army, leaving his allies in complete confusion, for Polyperchon's son Alexander with an army was waiting to attack the cities of the Peloponnesus. The Aetolians, who wished to please Olympias and Polyperchon, had occupied the pass at Thermopylae and barred Cassander from the passage. 
Cassander decided against forcing his way through this region, which was difficult to attack, but he secured boats and barges from Euboea and Locris and transported his army to Thessaly. Hearing that Polyperkin and his army were in position in Perhebia, he dispatched his general Collis with an army, ordering him to carry on the war with Polyperkin. Deneas, however, in order to occupy the passes, went to meet the soldiers who had been sent out by Olympias and gained control of the defile ahead of them. But Olympias, on learning that Cassander and a large army were near Macedonia, designated Aristinus general, ordering him to fight Cassander, and she herself went to Pydna accompanied by the following, Alexander's son, his mother Roxanne, and Thessalonus, daughter of Philip son of Amintas, also Didymia, daughter of Eacides king of the Epirotes and sister of that Pyrrhus who later fought against the Romans, the daughters of Attalus, and finally the kinsfolk of Olympias other more important. Friends Thus there were gathered about her a large number of persons, but persons for the most part useless in war, and there was not a sufficient supply of food for people who were about to endure a very long siege. Although the risk involved in all these circumstances was clear, nonetheless she decided to remain there, hoping that many Greeks and Macedonians would come to her aid by sea. She had with her some of the Ambracian horse and most of the soldiers who were accustomed to serve about the court, also those of Polyperkin's elephants that remained, for Cassander had gained possession of the rest of the elephants in his previous expedition into Macedonia. Cassander, going through the passes of Perhebia and arriving near Pydna, surrounded the city from sea to sea with a stockade and requisition ships, missile weapons of all sorts, and engines of war from those who wished to become his allies, with the intention of laying siege to Olympias by land and sea. Being informed that Eacides king of the Epirotes was about to come to the aid of Olympias with an army, he sent out Atarias as general, giving him an army and ordering him to meet the Epirotes. Atarias carried out his orders quickly and by occupying the passes from Epirus succeeded in holding Eacides inactive. Indeed, most of the Epirotes set out for Macedonia against their will and were mutinying in the camp, and Eacides, who wished at all costs to aid Olympias, by releasing from the army those who were disaffected and taking those who wished to share the fortunes of war with him, although he showed his zeal for a fight to the finish, was not a match for his opponents because few of his army remained. Those of the Epirotes, who went back to their native land rebelled against their absent king, condemned him to exile by a public decree, and made an alliance with Cassander. This was something that had never happened in Epirus from the time when Neoptolemus the son of Achilles was king of the land, for sons had always succeeded to their father's authority and had died on the throne up to this time. Cassander received Epirus in his alliance and sent Lysiscus to it as regent and general, at which the people throughout Macedonia who had previously held apart from the alliance abandoned the fortunes of Olympias in despair and joined themselves to Cassander. Her only hope of aid was from Polyperkin, and this was also unexpectedly crushed, for when Collis, who had been sent by Cassander as general, drew near Polyperkin in Perhebia and camped there, he corrupted most of Polyperkin's soldiers by bribes so that there remained only a few and these the most faithful. Thus Olympias' hopes were humbled in a brief time. In Asia Antigonus, who was wintering in Gatamala in Media, seeing that his force was weaker than that of the enemy, was anxious to get the better of them by attacking them without warning. It happened that the enemy were occupying winter quarters, which were divided in many parts, so that some of the detachments were six days' march distant from others. So Antigonus disapproved of the idea of marching through the inhabited country because the route was long and easily observed by the enemy, and decided that to venture the journey through the waterless desert, although difficult, would be most suitable for the attack that he had planned, for not only was it possible to go quickly by that route, but it was also easy to escape attention and fall unexpectedly upon an army that, because ignorant of his movements, would be scattered among villages. And at its ease. Having formed this plan he ordered the soldiers to be ready to break camp and to prepare ten days' supply of food that would not require cooking. He himself, after spreading the report that he was going to lead the army against Armenia, suddenly in contrary to the assumption of all set out across the desert, it being about this time of the winter solstice. He gave orders to build the fires in the camps by day, but to extinguish them completely at night, so that no one seeing them from the higher ground might take word to the enemy of what was happening, for almost the entire desert was a plain, but it was surrounded by high hills from which it was easy to see the gleam of fire from a great distance. After the army had been marching five days with great suffering, the soldiers because of the cold and to satisfy their urgent needs burned fires in the camps both by day and by night. 
On seeing this, certain of those who lived near the desert sent men to report it on the same day to Eumenes and Pusests, giving them dromedaries, for this animal can travel continuously for almost 1500 stades. When Pusests learned that a camp had been seen in the middle of the route, he made up his mind to withdraw to the most distant part of the territory in which they were wintering, for he was afraid that they might be overtaken by the enemy before the Allied force assembled from all directions. Seeing his lack of spirit, Eumenes urged him to take courage and to remain on the borders of the desert, for, he said, he had found a way through which he would delay Antigonus' arrival by three or four days. If this took place, he added, their own force would easily be assembled, and the enemy would be delivered over into their hands when utterly worn out and lacking everything. While all were wondering at this strange promise and were trying to learn what in the world it would be that could prevent the enemy from advancing, he ordered all the commanders to follow him with their own soldiers bringing fire in many jars. He then selected a place in the higher ground that faced toward the desert and was well situated to be clearly visible from every direction and by setting up markers laid out a space with a perimeter of seventy stades. Assigning an area to each of those who followed him, he ordered them at night to light fires about twenty cubits apart and to keep the flames bright in the first watch as if men were still awake and busy with the care of their bodies and the preparation of food, but dimmer in the second watch, and in the third watch, to leave only a very few, so that to those who watched from a distance it would seem to be a genuine camp. The soldiers carried out the directions. The flames were seen by some of those who pastured flocks on the hills opposite and who were friendly toward Pithon, the satrap of Media. Believing that this truly was a camp, they hurried down into the plain and carried the news to Antigonus and Pithon. These were astonished at this unexpected news and halted the march while they took counsel how they should use this information, for it was dangerous to lead an army that had been undergoing hardship and was in need of everything against hostile forces that were already assembled and were well provided with everything. Believing that there had been treachery and that the enemy had assembled because they knew in advance what was to happen, they gave up the plan of going straight forward and, turning to the right, went to unplundered parts of the inhabited country since they wished to refresh the army after its hardships. When Eumenes had outgeneraled the enemy in the manner described, he called together from all sides those of his soldiers who had been widely scattered while wintering in the villages. After building a palisade as a protection and strengthening the encampment by a deep ditch, he received those of the allies who came down from time to time, and he filled the camp with all the necessary supplies. But Antigonus, having got across the desert, learned from the inhabitants that, although almost all the rest of Eumenes' army had assembled, the elephants were slow in leaving their winter quarters and were near at hand, cut off from all assistance. He sent cavalry against them, two thousand Median lancers and two hundred Tarentines, and all his light infantry, for he hoped that, by attacking the elephants when they were isolated, he could easily gain control of them and deprive the enemy of the strongest element in his army. Eumenes, however, guessing what was on foot, sent to the rescue fifteen hundred of the strongest cavalry and three thousand light infantry. Since the soldiers of Antigonus arrived first, the commanders of the elephants arranged them in a square and advanced, placing the baggage train in the center and in the rear the cavalry that accompanied the elephants, consisting of a force of not more than four hundred men. As the enemy fell upon them with all its weight and pressed ever more heavily, the cavalry was routed, overwhelmed by numbers, but those who were in charge of the elephants resisted at first and held firm even though they were receiving wounds from all directions and were not able to injure the enemy in return in any way, and then, when they were now becoming exhausted, the troops sent by Eumene suddenly appeared and rescued them from their danger. A few days later, when the armies were encamped opposite each other at a distance of forty stades, each general drew up his army for battle, expecting to decide the issue. Antigonus placed his cavalry on the wings, giving the command of the left to Pithon and that of the right to his own son Demetrius, beside whom he himself planned to fight. He stationed the foot soldiers in the center and extended the elephants across the whole front, filling the spaces between them with light-armed troops. The total number of his army was 22,000 foot, 9,000 horse, including the additional troops enlisted in Media, and 65 elephants. When Eumenes learned that Antigonus had taken his place on the right with his best cavalry, he drew up his army against him, stationing his best troops on the left wing. In fact, he placed there most of the satraps with the selected bodies of cavalry that accompanied them in battle, and he himself intended to take part in the fight along with them. There was also present with them Mithridates, the son of Ariobarzanes and a descendant of one of the seven Persians who slew the Magian Smyrtes, a man remarkable for courage and trained from childhood as a soldier. 
In front of the whole wing, he drew up in a curved line the sixty strongest of the elephants and screened the interval with light troops. Of the foot soldiers he placed first the hypaspists, then the silver shields, and finally the mercenaries and those of the other soldiers who were armed in the Macedonian fashion. In front of the infantry he stationed elephants and an adequate force of his light troops. On the right wing he drew up the weaker of the cavalry and of the elephants, putting all of them under the command of Philip, whom he ordered to avoid battle and to observe the outcome on the other wing. In all, there were in Yumin's army at this time 36,700 foot soldiers, 6,000 horsemen and 114 elephants. A short time before the battle Antigenes, the general of the Silver Shields, sent one of the Macedonian horsemen toward the hostile phalanx, ordering him to draw near to it and make proclamation. This man, riding up alone to within earshot opposite the place where the phalanx of Antigonus Macedonians was stationed, shouted, Wicked men, are you sinning against your fathers, who conquered the whole world under Philip and Alexander, and added that in a little while they would see that these veterans were worthy both of the kings and of their own past battles. At this time, the youngest of the silver shields were about sixty years old, most of the others about seventy, and some even older, but all of them were irresistible because of experience and strength, such was the skill and daring acquired through the unbroken series of their battles. When this proclamation had been delivered as we have said, there arose from the soldiers of Antigonus angry cries to the effect that they were being forced to fight against their kinsfolk and their elders, but from the ranks of Eumenes there came a cheer and a demand that he lead them against the enemy as soon as possible. When Eumenes saw their enthusiasm, he gave the sign by which he directed the trumpeters to sound the signal for combat and the whole army to raise the battle cry. The first to join in battle were the elephants, and after them the main body of the cavalry. Since the plain was of great extent and entirely uncultivated because of the salt that permeated it, such a cloud of dust was raised by the cavalry that from a little distance one could not easily see what was happening. When Antigonus perceived this, he dispatched the Median cavalry in an adequate force of Tarentines against the baggage of the enemy, for he hoped, as indeed happened, that this maneuver might not be discovered because of the dust, and that by the capture of the baggage he might prevail over the enemy without labor. The detachment rode around the flank of their opponents and without being noticed attacked the baggage train, which was about five stades distant from the battle. They found that it was packed with a multitude of persons who were useless for fighting but had few defenders, and after quickly defeating those who resisted, they captured all the others. While this was taking place, Antigonus joined battle with those who were opposite him and by appearing with a large number of cavalry struck panic into Pusas, satrap of Persia, who in retiring from the dust cloud with his own cavalry drew away 1,500 others as well. You means, although he and a few troopers were left unsupported at the extremity of the wing, regarded it as shameful to yield to fortune and flee, preferring to die while still upholding with noble resolution the trust that had been given him by the kings, he forced his way toward Antigonus himself. A fierce cavalry battle ensued, in which you means men were superior in spirit, but those of Antigonus had the advantage in number, and many were falling on both sides. It was at this time, while the elephants also were struggling against each other, that Eumenes' leading elephant fell after having been engaged with the strongest of those arrayed against it. Thereupon Eumenes, seeing that his forces were everywhere having the worst of it, led what remained of the cavalry out of the battle and went around to the other wing, where he assumed command of those troops whom he had assigned to Philip and had ordered to avoid fighting. This was the outcome of the cavalry engagement. As for the infantry, the silver shields in close order fell heavily upon their adversaries, killing some of them in hand-to-hand -hand fighting and forcing others to flee. They were not to be checked in their charge and engaged the entire opposing phalanx, showing themselves so superior in skill and strength that of their own men they lost not one, but of those who opposed them they slew over five thousand and routed the entire force of foot soldiers, whose numbers were many times their own. When Eumenes learned that his baggage train was taken but that the cavalry force of Pusas was not far away, he tried to collect all his mounted men and renew the cavalry battle against Antigonus, for he hoped, if superior in battle, not only to save his own baggage, but also to capture that of the enemy. Since Pusas, however, would not listen to him but on the contrary retired still farther to a certain river, and since night was now coming on, Eumenes was forced to yield to the situation. Antigonus divided his cavalry into two bodies with one of which he himself lay in wait for Eumenes, watching for his first move, but the other he gave to Pithon and ordered him to attack the silver shields now that they had been cut off from their cavalry support. 
when Pithon promptly carried out his orders, the Macedonians formed themselves into a square and withdrew safely to the river, where they accused Pusas of being responsible for the defeat of the mounted forces. After Eumenes joined them at about the time for lighting lamps, they took counsel together what should be done. The satraps, indeed, said that it was necessary to retire to the upper satrapies as rapidly as possible, but Eumenes declared that they should stay and fight it out, for the phalanx of the enemy had been shattered and the cavalry forces on the two sides were equal. The Macedonians, however, refused to heed either party since their baggage had been taken, and their children, their wives, and many other relatives were in the hands of the enemy. The meeting accordingly broke up without having adopted any generally approved plan, whereupon the Macedonians secretly entered into negotiations with Antigonus, seized and surrendered Eumenes, recovered their baggage, and after receiving pledges were enrolled in Antigonus' army. In the same way the satraps and most of the other commanders and soldiers deserted their general, thinking only of their own safety. Now that Antigonus had unexpectedly mastered Eumenes and all the army that had been opposing him, he seized Antigenes, the commander of the Silver Shields, put him into a pit, and burned him alive. He slew Eudamus, who had brought the elephants from India, and Salbanus, as well as certain others of those who had always been hostile to him. Putting Eumenes under guard, he considered how best to dispose of him. He wished, indeed, to have it aside a man who was a good general and who would be under obligations to him, but he had little faith in Eumenes' promises because of the latter's loyalty to Olympias and the kings, in fact, on the previous occasion, after Eumenes had been spared by Antigonus at Nora in Phrygia, he had nonetheless supported the kings most wholeheartedly. When Antigonus saw also that the ardent desire of the Macedonians for the punishment of Eumenes was not to be turned aside, he put him to death, but because of his former friendship for him, he burned his body, and after placing his bones in an urn, he sent them to his relatives. Among the wounded there was also brought in as a captive the historian Hieronymus of Cardia, who hitherto always had been held in honor by Eumenes, but after Eumenes' death enjoyed the favor and confidence of Antigonus. After Antigonus had taken his entire army into Media, he himself spent the winter in a village that is near Agbatna, where the capital of this country is situated, but he distributed the soldiers throughout the entire satrapy and particularly in the eparchy called Regi, which had received this name from a catastrophe that had occurred there in former times. Of all the lands in that part of the world, its cities had been the most numerous and the most prosperous, but it had experienced so violent an earthquake that both the cities and all their inhabitants vanished, and, in general, the land was altered and new rivers and marshy lakes appeared in place of the former ones. At this time occurred the third inundation of the city of Rhodes, which destroyed many of its inhabitants. Of these floods, the first did little damage to the population since the city was newly founded and therefore contained much open space, the second was greater and caused the death of more persons. The last befell at the beginning of spring, great rainstorms suddenly bursting forth with hail of incredible size. Indeed, hailstones fell weighing a mina and sometimes more, so that many of the houses collapsed because of the weight and no small number of the inhabitants were killed. Since Rhodes is shaped like a theatre and since the streams of water were thus deflected chiefly into a single region, the lower parts of the city were straightway flooded, for, because it was thought that the rainy season of winter had passed, the drains had been neglected and the drainage openings through the city walls had become clogged. The water that suddenly gathered filled the whole region about the market and the temple of Dionysus, and then, as the flood was already advancing to the temple of Asclepius, all were struck with fear and began to follow various plans for gaining safety. Some of them fled to ships, others ran to the theatre, certain of those overthrown by the calamity in their extremity climbed upon the highest altars and the bases of statues. When the city and all its inhabitants were in danger of being utterly destroyed, relief of a sort came of itself, for, as the walls gave way over a long stretch, the water that had been confined poured out through this opening into the sea, and each man soon returned again to his former place. It was to the advantage of those who were endangered that the flood came by day, for most of the people escaped in time from their houses to the higher parts of the city, and also that the houses were not constructed of sun-dried brick but of stone and that for this reason those who took refuge upon the roofs were safe. Yet in this great disaster more than 500 persons lost their lives, while some houses collapsed completely and others were badly shaken. Such was the disaster which befell Rhodes. 
when Antigonus, who was wintering in Media, was informed that Pithon was winning the support of many of the soldiers in the winter quarters by promises and gifts and that he planned to revolt, he concealed his own intentions and, pretending not to believe those who were spreading the charges, he rebuked them, in the hearing of many, for trying to disrupt his friendship and caused a report to be spread abroad that he was about to leave Pithon as general of the upper satrapies with an army. Sufficient for their safety. He even wrote to Pithon himself a letter asking him to come as soon as possible, so that he might discuss the necessary matters with him in person and then quickly make his journey to the sea. He devised this plan because he wished to prevent Pithon from suspecting the truth and to persuade him to come within reach on the assumption that he was about to be left behind as satrap, for it was no easy matter to arrest a man by force who had gained preferment for merit while serving under Alexander and who at that very time was satrap of Media and had curried favor with the entire army. Pithon, who was wintering in the most distant parts of Media, had already corrupted a large number who promised to join him in the revolt, but when his friends wrote to him about the plans of Antigonus and hinted at his own great prospects, he was deceived by empty expectations and came to Antigonus. The latter, when he had gained possession of his person and had accused him before the members of the council, easily won a conviction and had him executed at once. Then, gathering the army into one place, he appointed Orontabates, a Mede, satrap of Media, but he made Hippostratus general with an infantry force of 3,500 mercenaries. Antigonus himself moved to Ecbatna with his army. There he took possession of 5,000 talents of uncoined silver and then led the army into Persia, the march to the capital, which is called Persepolis, lasting about 20 days. While Antigonus was on the march, Pithon's friends who had shared in his conspiracy, of whom the most notable were Meliger and Menoidas, collected the scattered comrades of Eumenes and of Pithon to the number of 800 mounted men. At first they harried the territory of those Medes who refused to join the revolt, but afterwards, on learning that Hippostratus and Orontabates were encamped with no thought of danger, they set upon the camp by night. They almost took the outer works, but were overcome by numbers and withdrew after winning certain of the soldiers to join the revolt. Since these were without heavy equipment and were all mounted on horses, their raids were unexpected, and the country was filled with confusion. After some time, however, they were hemmed up in a narrow place that was surrounded by cliffs, where some of them were killed and the others were taken alive. Meliger and Ocrans the Mede, who were among the commanders, and some of the outstanding men were killed while resisting the attack. This was the outcome of the revolt in Media. As soon as Antigonus came into Persia, he was granted the dignity of kingship by the inhabitants as if he was the acknowledged lord of Asia, and he himself sitting in council with his friends considered the question of the satrapies. He permitted Tlepolemus to retain Carmania, and likewise Stasener to retain Bactriane, for it was not easy to remove them by sending a message since they had conducted themselves well toward the inhabitants and had many supporters. He sent Avitus to Arya, but when Avitus died soon afterwards he put Evagoras in his place, a man admired for both courage and shrewdness. He permitted Oxyarts, the father of Roxanne, to keep the satrapy in Peroponicity as before, for he too could not be removed without a long campaign and a strong army. From Aracosia he summoned Sebertius, who was well disposed to him, permitted him to retain the satrapy, and assigned to him the most turbulent of the silver shields, ostensibly that they might be useful in the war, but in reality to ensure their destruction, for he privately directed the satrap to send a few of them at a time on duties in which they were bound to be killed. Among them there were, as it happened, those who had betrayed Eumenes, so that punishment for their treachery to their general came upon them speedily. Unholy acts, in truth, are of advantage to princes because of their power, but to private individuals who have merely obeyed orders they are usually the cause of great evil. Now Antigonus, perceiving that Pusestes was enjoying great favor among the Persians, first took his satrapy away from him. Then when the Persians were angry, and when Thespius, one of their leading men, even said frankly that the Persians would not obey anyone else, Antigonus had this man killed and set up Asclepiodorus as ruler of Persia, giving him a sufficient number of soldiers. As for Pusestes, Antigonus, after leading him on to hope for other things and filling him with vain expectations, removed him from the country. While Antigonus himself was journeying to Susa, he was met at the Pazitigris River by Xenophilus, the supervisor of the treasury at Susa, who had been sent by Seleucus with orders to carry out Antigonus every command. Antigonus received him and pretended to honor him among his closest friends, taking care lest he change his mind and shut him out again. 
When he himself had occupied the citadel of Susa, he found in it the golden climbing vine and a great number of other objects of art, weighing all told fifteen thousand talents. There was collected for him, besides, a great amount of money from the crowns and the other gifts, and also from the spoils. This came to five thousand talents, and there was another equal amount in media apart from the treasury in Susa, so that in all twenty-five thousand talents were gathered together. Such was the state of the affairs of Antigonus. Now that we have completed the account of events in Asia, we shall turn our attention to Europe and set forth what took place there following the events previously described. Although Cassander had shut Olympias into Pydna in Macedonia, he was not able to assault the walls because of the winter storms, but by encamping about the city, throwing up a palisade from sea to sea, and blockading the port, he prevented any who might wish to aid the queen from doing so. And as supplies were rapidly exhausted, he created such famine among those within that they were completely incapacitated. In truth, they were brought to such extreme need that they gave each soldier five chunices of grain per month, sawed up wood and fed the sawdust to the imprisoned elephants, and slaughtered the pack animals and horses for food. While the situation of the city was so serious, and while Olympias was still clinging to hopes of rescue from outside, the elephants died from lack of nourishment, the horsemen that were not in the ranks and did not receive any food whatever nearly all perished, and no small number of the soldiers also met the same fate. Some of the non-Greeks, their natural needs overcoming their scruples, found flesh to eat by collecting the bodies of the dead. Since the city was being quickly filled with corpses, those in charge of the queen's company, though they buried some of the bodies, threw others over the city wall. The sight of these was horrible, and their stench was unbearable, not merely to ladies who were of the queen's court and addicted to luxury, but also to those of the soldiers who were habituated to hardship. As spring came on and the one increased from day to day, many of the soldiers gathered together and appealed to Olympias to let them go because of the lack of supplies. Since she could neither issue any food at all nor break the siege, she permitted them to withdraw. Cassander, after welcoming all the deserters and treating them in most friendly fashion, sent them to the various cities, for he hoped that when the Macedonians learned from them how weak Olympias was, they would despair of her cause and he was not mistaken in his surmise about what would happen, those who had resolved to fight on the side of the besieged forces changed their minds and went over to Cassander, and the only men in Macedonia to preserve their loyalty were Aristinus and Monimus, of whom Aristinus was ruler of Amphipolis and Monimus of Pella. But Olympias, when she saw that most of her friends had gone over to Cassander and that those who remained were not strong enough to come to her aid, attempted to launch a quinquireme and by this means to save herself and her friends. When, however, a deserter brought news of this attempt to the enemy and Cassander sailed up and took the ship, Olympias, recognizing that her situation was beyond hope, sent envoys to treat of terms. When Cassander gave his opinion that she must put all her interests into his hands, she with difficulty persuaded him to grant the single exception that he guarantee her personal safety. As soon as he had gained possession of the city, he sent men to take over Pella and Amphipolis. Now Monimus, the ruler of Pella, on hearing the fate of Olympias, surrendered his city, but Aristinus at first was minded to cling to his position, since he had many soldiers and had recently enjoyed a success. That is, a few days before this in a battle against Cassander's general Cretivas he had killed most of those who faced him, and when Cretivas himself with two thousand men had fled to Budindia in Bysalsha, he invested him, took him by siege, and dismissed him on terms after taking away his arms. Aristinus, encouraged by this and ignorant of the death of Eumenes, believing, moreover, that Alexander and Polyperkin would support him, refused to surrender Amphipolis. But when Olympias wrote to him demanding his loyalty and ordering him to surrender, he perceived that it was necessary to do as ordered and delivered the city to Cassander, receiving pledges for his own safety. Cassander, seeing that Aristinus was respected because of the preferment he had received from Alexander, and being anxious to put out of the way any who were able to lead a revolt, caused his death through the agency of the kinsfolk of Curtivas. He also urged the relatives of those whom Olympias had slain to accuse the aforesaid woman in the general assembly of the Macedonians. They did as he had ordered, and, although Olympias was not present and had none to speak in her defense, the Macedonians condemned her to death. Cassander, however, sent some of his friends to Olympias advising her to escape secretly, promising to provide a ship for her and to carry her to Athens. 
He acted thus, not for the purpose of securing her safety, but in order that she, condemning herself to exile and meeting death on the voyage, might seem to have met a punishment that was deserved, for he was acting with caution both because of her rank and because of the fickleness of the Macedonians. As Olympias, however, refused to flee but on the contrary was ready to be judged before all the Macedonians, Cassander, fearing that the crowd might change its mind if it heard the queen defend herself and was reminded of all the benefits conferred on the entire nation by Alexander and Philip, sent to her two hundred soldiers who were best fitted for such a task, ordering them to slay her as soon as possible. They, accordingly, broke into the royal house, but when they beheld Olympias, overawed by her exalted rank, they withdrew with their task unfulfilled. But the relatives of her victims, wishing to curry favor with Cassander as well as to avenge their dead, murdered the queen, who uttered no ignoble or womanish plea. Such was the end of Olympias, who had attained to the highest dignity of the women of her day, having been daughter of Neoptolemus, king of the Epirotes, sister of the Alexander who made a campaign into Italy, and also wife of Philip, who was the mightiest of all who down to this time had ruled in Europe, and mother of Alexander, whose deeds were the greatest and most glorious. As for Cassander, now that his affairs had succeeded according to his intentions, he began to embrace in his hopes the Macedonian kingdom. For this reason he married Thessalonus, who was Philip's daughter and Alexander's half-sister, since he desired to establish a connection with the royal house. He also founded on Pallene a city called Cassandria after his own name, uniting with it as one city the cities of the peninsula, Potidia, and a considerable number of the neighboring towns. He also settled in this city those of the Olynthians who survived, not few in number. Since a great deal of land, and good land too, was included within the boundaries of Cassandria, and since Cassander was very ambitious for the city's increase, it quickly made great progress and became the strongest of the cities of Macedonia. Cassander had determined to do away with Alexander's son and the son's mother, Roxanne, so that there might be no successor to the kingdom, but for the present, since he wished to observe what the common people would say about the slaying of Olympias, and since he had no news of Antigonus' success, he placed Roxanne and the child in custody, transferring them to the citadel of Amphipolis, in command of which he placed Glaucias, one of his most trusted henchmen. Also he took away the pages who, according to custom, were being brought up as companions of the boy, and he ordered that he should no longer have royal treatment but only such as was proper for any ordinary person of private station. After this, already conducting himself as a king and administering the affairs of the realm, he buried Eurydice and Philip, the queen and king, and also Cinna, whom Alcides had slain, in Egi as was the royal custom. After honoring the dead with funeral games, he enrolled those of the Macedonians who were fit for military service, for he had decided to make a campaign into the Peloponnesus. While Cassander was engaged with these matters, Polyperkin was being besieged in Azorius in Perhebia, but on hearing of the death of Olympias he finally, despairing of success in Macedonia, escaped from the city with a few followers. Leaving Thessaly and taking over the troops led by Iacides, he withdrew into Aetolia, believing that he could wait there with greatest safety and observe the changes in the situation, for as it chanced he was on friendly terms with this people. But Cassander, after assembling an adequate force, set out from Macedonia, desiring to drive Polyperkin's son Alexander from the Peloponnesus, for of those who opposed Cassander he alone was left with an army, and he had occupied strategically situated cities and districts. Cassander crossed Thessaly without loss, but when he found the pass at Thermopylae guarded by Aetolians, he with difficulty dislodged them and entered Boeotia. Summoning from all sides those of the Thebans who survived, he undertook to re-establish Thebes, for he assumed that this was a most excellent opportunity to set up once more a city that had been widely known both for its achievements and for the myths that had been handed down about it, and he supposed that by this benevolent act he would acquire undying fame. The fact is that this city has experienced very many changes of fortune and has been destroyed on no few occasions, and it will not be out of place to recount here the chief events of its history. When, after the flood that occurred in the days of Deucalion, Cadmus built the Cadmia, which was called after his name, there came together there with him a folk whom some call the Spartoi because they had been gathered together from all sides, and others the Thebagenes because they were originally from Thebes but had been driven out and scattered by the flood. Be that as it may, these people then settled in the city but later the Anchilians defeated them in war and drove them out, at which time Cadmus and his followers also were driven to Illyria. Later Amphion and Zethus became masters of the site and then built the lower city for the first time, as the poet says. First by them was established Thebes of the Seven Gates. 
Then the inhabitants of the place were exiled a second time, for Polydorus, son of Cadmus, came back and was dissatisfied with the situation because of the misfortunes that had befallen Amphion in connection with his children. Next, when Polydorus' own descendants were kings and the whole country had already received the name Boeotia from Boeotus, who was the son of Melanip and Poseidon and had been ruler of the region, the Thebans for the third time suffered exile, for the Epigoni from Argos took the city by siege. The survivors of those driven out took refuge in Alalcamenia and on Mount Tilphosium, but after the Argives had departed they returned to their native city. After that, when the Thebans had gone to Asia for the Trojan War, those who were left behind were expelled along with the rest of the Boeotians by Pelasgians. Thereafter they met with many misfortunes, and only with difficulty in the fourth generation according to the prophecy of the ravens did they return to Boeotia and re-establish Thebes. From that time the city persisted for nearly 800 years, the Thebans at first becoming the leaders of their own people and later disputing for the leadership of the Greeks, until Alexander, son of Philip, captured the city by storm and destroyed it. In the twentieth year thereafter Cassander in his desire for glory, after first obtaining the consent of the Boeotians, rebuilt the city for those of the Thebans who survived. Many of the Greek cities shared in the resettlement both because of their pity for the unfortunate and because of the glory of the city. The Athenians, for example, rebuilt the greater part of the wall, and of the other Greeks, not alone from Greece itself but from Sicily and Italy as well, some erected buildings to the extent of their ability, and others sent money for the pressing needs. In this way, the Thebans recovered their city. To return to Cassander, he set out with his army for the Peloponnesus, but on finding that Alexander, son of Polyperchon, had blocked the isthmus with guards, he turned aside to Megara. There he constructed barges upon which he transported the elephants to Epidaurus, taking the rest of the army in boats. Coming to the city of the Argives, he forced it to abandon its alliance with Alexander and to join him, after which he won over the cities of Messenia except Ithom, and gained Hermiones through negotiation. As Alexander, however, did not come out to fight, he left at the end of the isthmus toward Gerania 2,000 soldiers commanded by Malichus and returned to Macedonia. When this year had passed, Praxibulus was archon at Athens, and in Rome, Nauseus Spurius and Marcus Poplius were consuls. While these held office Antigonus left Espizes, a native, as satrap of Susian, while he himself, having decided to convey all the money to the sea, prepared wagons and camels and, taking the treasure, set out for Babylonia with the army. In twenty-two days he arrived in Babylon, and Seleucus, the satrap of the country, honored him with gifts suitable for a king and feasted the whole army. When Antigonus, however, demanded an accounting for the revenues, Seleucus answered that he was not bound to undergo a public investigation of his administration of this country which the Macedonians had given him in recognition of his services rendered while Alexander was alive. As the dispute grew more serious each day, Seleucus, reasoning from the fate of Pithon, feared that Antigonus would some day seize a pretext and undertake to destroy him, for Antigonus seemed eager to put out of the way all of his associates who were of high rank and were capable of claiming a share in the government. Therefore to avoid this, he escaped with fifty horsemen, intending to retire into Egypt to Ptolemy, for word had spread abroad of Ptolemy's kindness and of his cordiality and friendliness toward those who fled to him. When Antigonus learned of the flight, he was pleased, since it seemed that he himself had been spared the necessity of laying violent hands upon a man who had been his friend and had actively cooperated with him, and that Seleucus, by condemning himself to exile, had surrendered his satrapy without struggle or danger. But then the Chaldean astrologers came to him and foretold that if ever he let Seleucus escape from his hands, the consequence would be that all Asia would become subject to Seleucus, and that Antigonus himself would lose his life in a battle against him. At this, Antigonus repented his former course and sent men to pursue Seleucus, but they, after tracking him for a certain distance, returned with their mission unaccomplished. Although Antigonus was accustomed to despise prophecies of this kind on other occasions, he was not a little troubled at this time, being disturbed by the reputation of the men, for they are reputed to possess a great deal of experience and to make most exact observations of the stars. Indeed, they declare that for many myriads of years the study of these matters has been pursued among them. It is also believed that they foretold to Alexander that, if he entered Babylon, he would die. And just as was the case with the prophecy about Alexander, it came to pass that this prophecy in regard to Seleucus was fulfilled according to the assertion of these men. Of this we shall speak in detail when we come to the proper period. 
Seleucus, arriving safely in Egypt, met with nothing but kindness from Ptolemy. He bitterly accused Antigonus, saying that Antigonus had determined to remove from their satrapies all who were men of rank and in particular those who had served under Alexander. As examples of this he mentioned the slaying of Pithon, the removal of Pusests from Persia, and his own experiences, for all of these men, who were guiltless of wrongdoing and had even performed great services out of friendship, had been patiently awaiting a reward for virtue. He reviewed also the magnitude of Antigonus' armed forces, his vast wealth, and his recent successes, and went on to intimate that in consequence he had become arrogant and had encompassed in his ambitious plans the entire kingdom of the Macedonians. When by such arguments he had induced Ptolemy to prepare for war, he sent certain of his friends to Europe, directing them to try by similar arguments to convert Cassander and Lysimachus into enemies of Antigonus. They quickly carried out their instructions, and the seed of a quarrel and of great wars began to grow. But Antigonus, who had deduced by reasoning from probabilities what course of action Seleucus was following, sent envoys to Ptolemy, Lysimachus, and Cassander, urging them to maintain the existing friendship. He next established a satrap of Babylonia that Pithon who had come from India, and then, setting out with his army, he marched toward Cilicia. He arrived at Malus and, after the setting of Orion, divided the army for passing the winter. He also took the money at Syinda, which amounted to 10,000 talents. Apart from this, there fell to him from the annual revenue 11,000 talents. As a result, he was a formidable antagonist both because of the size of his armies and because of the amount of his wealth. While Antigonus was going into Upper Syria, envoys arrived from Ptolemy, Lysimachus, and Cassander. When they had been brought into the council, they demanded that Cappadocia and Lycia be given to Cassander, Hellespontine Phrygia to Lysimachus, all Syria to Ptolemy, and Babylonia to Seleucus, and that Antigonus should divide the treasures that he had captured after the battle with Eumenes, since they too had had a share in the war. They said that if he did none of these things, they would all join in waging war on him. Antigonus answered rather harshly and bade them make ready for war, with the result that the envoys went away with their mission unaccomplished. At this Ptolemy, Lysimachus, and Cassander, after making a mutual alliance, gathered their forces and prepared stocks of arms, missiles, and the other needful things. But now that Antigonus saw that many men of great repute had combined against him and computed the extent of the war that was springing up, he summoned the nations, cities, and rulers to join his alliance. He sent Agesilas to the kings in Cyprus, Idomeneus, and Moschian to Rhodes, and his own nephew Ptolemy with an army to Cappadocia to raise the siege of Amisus, to drive out all who had been sent by Cassander into Cappadocia, and finally to take a position on the Hellespont and lie in wait for Cassander if he should try to cross over from Europe. He sent Aristodemus of Miletus to the Peloponnesus with a thousand talents, instructing him to establish friendship with Alexander and Polyperchon and, after raising an adequate force of mercenaries, to carry on the war against Cassander. He himself established at intervals throughout all that part of Asia of which he was master a system of fire signals and dispatch carriers, by means of which he expected to have quick service in all his business. After attending to these matters, Antigonus set out for Phoenicia, hastening to organize a naval force, for it so happened that his enemies then ruled the sea with many ships, but that he had, altogether, not even a few. Camping at Old Tyre in Phoenicia and intending to besiege Tyre, he called together the kings of the Phoenicians and the viceroys of Syria. He instructed the kings to assist him in building ships, since Ptolemy was holding in Egypt all the ships from Phoenicia with their crews. He ordered the viceroys to prepare quickly four and a half million measures of wheat, for such was the annual consumption. He himself collected wood cutters, sawyers, and shipwrights from all sides, and carried wood to the sea from Lebanon. There were 8,000 men employed in cutting and sawing the timber and 1,000 pair of draft animals in transporting it. This mountain range extends along the territory of Tripolis, Byblis, and Sidon, and is covered with cedar and cypress trees of wonderful beauty and size. He established three shipyards in Phoenicia, at Tripolis, Byblis, and Sidon, and a fourth in Cilicia, the timber for which was brought from Mount Taurus. There was also another in Rhodes, where the state agreed to make ships from imported timber. While Antigonus was busy with these matters and after he had established his camp near the sea, Seleucus arrived from Egypt with a hundred ships, which were royally equipped and which sailed excellently. 
As he sailed contemptuously along past the very camp, men from the allied cities and all who were cooperating with Antigonus were downhearted, for it was very clear that, since the enemy dominated the sea, they would plunder the lands of those who aided their opponents out of friendship for Antigonus. Antigonus, however, bade them be of good courage, affirming that in that very summer he would take the sea with five hundred vessels. While Antigonus was thus engaged, Agesilaus, the envoy whom he had sent to Cyprus, arrived with the information that Nicocrian and the most powerful of the other kings had made an alliance with Ptolemy, but that the kings of Sicyon, Lapithus, Marion, and Serenia had concluded a treaty of friendship with himself. On learning this, Antigonus left three thousand soldiers under Andronicus to carry on the siege, but he himself set out with the army and took by storm Joppa and Gaza, cities that had refused obedience. The soldiers of Ptolemy whom he captured he distributed among his own ranks, but he placed in each city a garrison to force the inhabitants to obey him. He himself then went back to the camp at Old Tyre and made preparations for the siege. At this time Ariston, to whose care the bones of Craterus had been entrusted by Eumenes, gave them for burial to Philadelphia, who had formerly been the wife of Craterus, but now was married to Demetrius, the son of Antigonus. This woman seems to have been of exceptional sagacity, for example, she would quell the troublemakers in the camp by dealing with each individual in a manner appropriate to his case, she would arrange marriages at her own expense for the sisters and daughters of the poor, and she would free from jeopardy many who had been trapped by false accusations. It is even said that her father Antipater, who is reputed to have been the wisest of the rulers of his own time, used to consult with Philadelphia about the most important matters when she was still a child. But the character of the woman will be more clearly revealed by my narrative as it progresses and by the events that brought change and a final crisis to the reign of Demetrius. This was the situation of the affairs of Antigonus and of Philadelphia, the wife of Demetrius. Of the generals who had been sent out by Antigonus, Aristodemus sailed to Laconia and, on receiving permission from the Spartans to recruit mercenaries, enrolled 8,000 soldiers from the Peloponnesus. Meeting Alexander and Polyperchon, he established friendship between them and Antigonus. He appointed Polyperchon general of the Peloponnesus, and he persuaded Alexander to sail to Antigonus in Asia. The other general, Ptolemy, proceeded with his army to Cappadocia where he found Amysus under siege by Asclepiodorus, a general of Cassander. He delivered the city from danger and recovered the satrapy after dismissing Asclepiodorus and his men under a truce. Thereafter advancing through Bithynia and finding Zibits, the king of the Bithynians, laying siege to the city of the Astacenians and the Chalcedonians, he forced him to abandon the siege. After making alliances with these cities and with Zibits and also taking hostages from them, he proceeded toward Ionia and Lydia, for Antigonus had written ordering him to go quickly to the support of the coast, since Seleucus was about to make a naval expedition into that region. It so happened that, as he finally drew near to this area, Seleucus was laying siege to Erythrae, but when he heard that the hostile force was near, he sailed away with nothing accomplished. Antigonus, after Polyperchon's son Alexander had come to him, made a pact of friendship with him, and then, calling a general assembly of the soldiers and of the aliens who were dwelling there, laid charges against Cassander, bringing forward the murder of Olympias and the treatment of Roxanne and the king. Moreover, he said that Cassander had married Thessalonus by force, and was clearly trying to establish his own claim to the Macedonian throne, and also that, although the Olynthians were very bitter enemies of the Macedonians, Cassander had re-established them in a city called by his own name and had rebuilt Thebes, which had been raised by the Macedonians. When the crowd showed that it shared his wrath, he introduced a decree according to the terms of which it was voted that Cassander was to be an enemy unless he destroyed these cities again, released the king and his mother Roxanne from imprisonment and restored them to the Macedonians, and, in general, yielded obedience to Antigonus the duly established general who had succeeded to the guardianship of the throne. It was also stated that all the Greeks were free, not subject to foreign garrisons, and autonomous. When the soldiers had voted in favor of these measures, Antigonus sent men in every direction to carry the decree, for he believed that through their hope of freedom he would gain the Greeks as eager participants with him in the war, and that the generals and satraps in the upper satrapies, who had suspected that he was determined to depose the kings who inherited from Alexander, would, if he publicly took upon himself the war in their behalf, all change their minds and promptly obey his orders. Having finished these matters, he gave Alexander five hundred talents and, after leading him to hope for great things to come, sent him back to the Peloponnesus. 
He himself, after summoning ships from Rhodes and equipping most of those that had been built, sailed against Tyre. Although he pressed the siege with vigor for a year and three months, controlling the sea and preventing food from being brought in, yet after he had reduced the besieged to extreme want, he permitted the soldiers who had come from Ptolemy to depart each with his own possessions, but when the city capitulated, he introduced into it a garrison to watch it closely. While these things were going on, Ptolemy, who had heard what had been decreed by the Macedonians with Antigonus in regard to the freedom of the Greeks, published a similar decree himself, since he wished the Greeks to know that he was no less interested in their autonomy than was Antigonus. Each of them, indeed, perceiving that it was a matter of no little moment to gain the goodwill of the Greeks, rivaled the other in conferring favors upon this people. Ptolemy also brought into his alliance a Sander, satrap of Curia, who was strong and had a considerable number of cities subject to him. To the kings on Cyprus, to whom he had previously sent three thousand soldiers, he now dispatched a strong army, for he was anxious to force those who were opposing to carry out his commands. Myrmidon the Athenian, therefore, was sent with ten thousand men, and Polycletus with a hundred ships, while Menelaus, his own brother, was made commander of the whole force. When these had sailed to Cyprus and there had found Seleucus and his fleet, they met together and considered what they ought to do. They decided that Polycletus with fifty ships should sail to the Peloponnesus and carry on the war against Aristodemus, Alexander, and Polyperchon, that Myrmidon and the mercenaries should go to Korea to aid Asander, who was being attacked by Ptolemy the general, and that Seleucus and Menelaus, left in Cyprus with King Nicocreon and the other allies, should carry on the war against those who opposed them. After the forces had been divided in this way, Seleucus took Serenia and Lapithus, secured the support of Stasiacus, king of the Marienses, forced the ruler of the Amethusiae to give a guarantee, and laid unremitting siege with all his forces to the city of the Sicienses, which he had not been able to induce to join him. At about this time forty ships under the command of the Mycen came to Antigonus from the Hellespont, and likewise Dioscorides put in with eighty vessels from the Hellespont and Rhodes. The first to be finished of the ships that had been made in Phoenicia were also at hand fully equipped, including those captured at Tyre, they were 120, so that in all there were gathered together about Antigonus 240 fully equipped ships of war. Of these there were 90 with four orders of oarsmen, 10 with 5, 3 with 9, 10 with 10, and 30 undecked boats. Dividing this naval force, he sent fifty ships to the Peloponnesus, and ordered his nephew, Dioscorides, whom he had made commander of the rest, to make a circuit of the sea, guaranteeing the safety of the allies and winning the support of the islands that had not yet joined the alliance. Such was the state of Antigonus' affairs. Now that we have related the events that took place in Asia, we shall in turn discuss the affairs of Europe. Apollonides, who had been appointed general over Argos by Cassander, made a raid into Arcadia by night and captured the city of the Stymphalians. But while he was engaged in this, those of the Argives who were hostile to Cassander sent for Alexander, Polyperchon's son, promising to hand the city over to him. Alexander, however, delayed, and Apollonides arrived back in Argos before him. Finding about five hundred of his antagonists gathered in the Prytanean, he prevented them from leaving the building and burned them alive. He exiled most of the others, but arrested and killed a few. When Cassander learned of Aristodemus' arrival in the Peloponnesus and of the multitude of mercenaries that he had collected there, his first effort was to turn Polyperchon from his alliance with Antigonus. When Polyperchon, however, would not listen to him, he brought his army through Thessaly into Boeotia. After aiding the Thebans in building their walls, he went on into the Peloponnesus. First, he took Sencrii and plundered the fields of the Corinthians. Then, after taking two fortresses by storm, he dismissed under a truce the garrisons that had been placed in them by Alexander. Next, he attacked the city of Orchomenus. Being admitted by the faction hostile to Alexander, he installed a garrison in the city, and when the friends of Alexander took refuge in the shrine of Artemis, he permitted the citizens to treat them as they wished. The people of Orchomenus, accordingly, dragged the suppliants away by force and slew them all, contrary to the universal custom of the Greeks. Cassander passed on into Messenia, but finding the city garrisoned by Polyperchon, he temporarily relinquished his plan of laying siege to it. Passing over into Arcadia, he left Damis as governor of Megalopolis, while he himself, after going into Argolis and presiding at the Nemean Games, returned into Macedonia. 
After he had gone, Alexander visited the cities of the Peloponnesus accompanied by Aristodemus and tried to drive out the garrisons that had been established by Cassander and to restore freedom to the cities. As soon as Cassander learned this, he sent Prepolos to Alexander, asking him to desert Antigonus and conclude with himself an alliance in due form. He said that if he did this, he would give him the command of all the Peloponnesus, make him general of an army, and honor him according to his deserts. Alexander, since he saw that the thing for which he had originally made war against Cassander was being granted to him, made the alliance and was appointed general of the Peloponnesus. While all this was taking place, Polycletus, who had been sent by Seleucus from Cyprus, sailed into Sencreae, but when he heard of Alexander's change in allegiance and saw that there was no hostile force in existence, he sailed for Pamphylia. He sailed along the coast from Pamphylia to Aphrodisias in Cilicia, and, hearing that Theodotus, the admiral of Antigonus, was sailing from Padera in Lycia in Rhodian ships with carrying crews, and that Paralaz was accompanying him with an army on land, thus securing the safety of the fleet in its voyage, he outgeneraled both of them. Disembarking his soldiers, he concealed them in a suitable place where it was necessary for the enemy to pass, taking cover behind a promontory while awaiting the coming of the enemy. The army was first to fall into the ambush, Paralaz was captured, some of the rest fell while fighting, and others were taken prisoners. When the Rhodian ships tried to go to the aid of their own forces, Polycletus sailed up suddenly with his fleet drawn up for battle and easily routed the disorganized enemy. The result was that all the ships were captured and a considerable number of the men also, among them Theodotus himself, who was wounded and a few days later died. After Polycletus had gained so great an advantage without danger, he sailed away to Cyprus and thence to Pelusium. Ptolemy praised him, honored him with great gifts, and gave him much greater preferment as having been the author of an important victory. He released Paralaz and some of the other captives when an envoy in their behalf came from Antigonus. He himself went to Acregma, as it is called, where he conferred with Antigonus, returning again since Antigonus would not agree to his demands. Now that we have related the deeds of the European Greeks in Greece and Macedonia, we shall consider in due order the history of the western regions. Agathocles, the dynast of Syracuse, who was holding a fort of the Messenians, promised to surrender the position on receiving from them thirty talents, but when the Messenians gave him the money, he not only failed to keep his promise to those who had put faith in him, but he also undertook to capture Messini itself. On learning that a certain section of the wall of the city was in ruins, he sent his cavalry by land from Syracuse while he himself sailed close to the city by night with light vessels. Since, however, the intended victims of the plot learned of it beforehand, this attack failed, but he sailed to Miley and besieged the fort, which surrendered by capitulation. He then departed for Syracuse, but at the time of the harvest he made another expedition against Messini. He camped near the city and made repeated attacks, but he was not able to inflict any considerable damage upon his enemies, for many of the exiles from Syracuse had taken refuge in the city, and these fought furiously both for the sake of their own safety and because of their hatred for the tyrant. At this time there came envoys from Carthage, who censured Agathocles for what he had done on the ground that he had violated the treaty. They also secured peace for the people of Messini, and then, when they had forced the tyrant to restore the fort, they sailed back to Libya. Agathocles, however, went on to Abyssinian, an allied city, where he put to death those who appeared to be hostile to him, being more than forty in number. While these things were taking place, the Romans in their war with the Samnites took Ferentum, a city of Apulia, a by storm. The inhabitants of Nusiria, which is called Alphaterna, be yielding to the persuasion of certain persons, abandoned their friendship for Rome and made an alliance with the Samnites. After this year had passed, Nicodorus was archon at Athens, and at Rome Lucius Papirius was consul for the fourth time and Quintus Publius for the second. While these held office, Aristodemus, who had been made general by Antigonus, on learning of the defection of Polyperchon's son Alexander, presented his own side of the matter to the common assembly of the Aetolians and persuaded the majority to support the fortunes of Antigonus. He himself, however, with his mercenaries crossed from Aetolia to the Peloponnesus, where he found Alexander and the Aelians laying siege to Cyllene, and, arriving at a moment opportune for the endangered people, raised the siege. Leaving troops there to ensure the safety of the stronghold, he advanced into Achaia and freed Patray, which was subject to a garrison of Cassander's troops. 
After a successful siege of Aegium he became master of its garrison, but, although he wished to establish freedom for the people of Aegium according to the decree, he was blocked by the following incident, for while the soldiers were engaged in pillaging, many of the Aegeanses were killed and very many of their buildings were destroyed. Thereafter, when Aristodemus had sailed to Aetolia, the Dimeans, who were subject to a garrison sent by Cassander, cut off their city by a dividing wall in such a way that it was isolated and separated from the citadel. Then, after encouraging each other to assert their freedom, they invested the citadel and made unremitting attacks upon it. But Alexander on learning of this came with his army, forced his way within the wall, and became master of the city, slaying some of the Dimeans, imprisoning others, and sending many into exile. When Alexander had departed from the city, the survivors remained quiet for some time, stunned by the magnitude of the disaster and also bereft of allies. After a little while, however, they summoned from Aegeum the mercenaries of Aristodemus and once more made an attack on the garrison. Taking the citadel, they freed the city, and when they had massacred most of those who had been left there, they likewise slew all those of their own citizens who maintained friendship with Alexander. While this was taking place, Polyperchon's son Alexander, as he was setting out from Sicyon with his army, was killed by Alexion of Sicyon and certain others who pretended to be friends. His wife, Cratesipolis, however, succeeded to his power and held his army together, since she was most highly esteemed by the soldiers for her acts of kindness, for it was her habit to aid those who were in misfortune and to assist many of those who were without resources. She possessed, too, skill in practical matters and more daring than one would expect in a woman. Indeed, when the people of Sicyon scorned her because of her husband's death and assembled under arms in an effort to gain their freedom, she drew up her forces against them and defeated them with great slaughter, but arrested and crucified about thirty. When she had a firm hold on the city, she governed the Sicyonians, maintaining many soldiers, who were ready for any emergency. Such, then, was the situation in the Peloponnesus. When Cassander saw that the Aetolians were supporting Antigonus and were also engaged in a border war with the Acarnanians, he decided that it was to his advantage at a single stroke to make the Acarnanians his allies and to humble the Aetolians. For this reason, setting out from Macedonia with a large army, he moved into Aetolia and camped beside the river called the Campolis. When he had summoned the Acarnanians to a common assembly and had related to them in detail how they had been engaged in border warfare from ancient days, he advised them to move from their villages, which were small and unfortified, into a few cities so that they would no longer, because their homes were scattered, be powerless to aid each other and find difficulty in assembling to meet the unexpected raids of their enemies. The Acarnanians were persuaded, and most of them came to live together in Stratus, since this was their strongest and largest city, but the Aeneadi and some others gathered at Soria, and the Darians and the rest settled at Agrinium. Cassander left Lysiscus in command with adequate troops, ordering him to aid the Acarnanians, but he himself moved upon Lucas with an army and secured the allegiance of the city through an embassy. Thereafter, directing his campaign to the Adriatic, he took Apollonia at the first assault. Advancing into Illyria and crossing the Hebrus River, he drew up his army against Glaucias, the king of the Illyrians. Being successful in the battle, he made a treaty with the king according to which Glaucias was not to wage war on Cassander's allies, then he himself, after securing the city of Epidamnus and establishing a garrison therein, returned to Macedonia. When Cassander had departed from Aetolia, the Aetolians, gathering together to the number of three thousand, invested Agrinium and began a siege. The inhabitants of the place came to terms with them, agreeing to surrender the city and depart under safe conduct, but when, trusting in the treaty, they were leaving, the Aetolians violated the terms, pursued hotly after these men while they were anticipating no danger, and slaughtered all but a few of them. When Cassander had arrived in Macedonia and heard that war was being waged on all the cities in Curia that were allied to Ptolemy and Seleucus, he sent an army into Curia, for he both wished to aid his allies and at the same time was eager to force Antigonus into distracting undertakings so that he might not have leisure for crossing over into Europe. He also wrote to Demetrius of Phalerum and to Dionysius, who commanded the garrison on Nunichia, bidding them dispatch twenty ships to Lemnos. They at once sent the boats with Aristotle in command of them. After the latter had sailed to Lemnos and had summoned Seleucus and a fleet, he undertook to persuade the Lemnians to revolt from Antigonus, but as they did not assent, he ravaged their land, invested the city, and began a siege. 
Afterwards, however, Seleucus sailed off to Kos, and Dioscurides, who had been made admiral by Antigonus, on learning of Seleucus' departure, swooped down upon Lemnos, drove Aristotle himself from the island, and captured most of his ships together with their crews. Asander and Prepolos were in command of the expedition sent by Cassander into Curia, and, on being informed that Ptolemaeus, the general of Antigonus, had divided his army for wintering and was himself engaged in burying his father, they dispatched Eupolemus to lie in wait for the enemy near Caprima in Curia, sending with him eight thousand foot soldiers and two hundred horse. But at this time Ptolemaeus, who had heard from some deserters of the plan of the enemy, gathered from the troops who were wintering near by 8,300 foot soldiers and 600 horse. Falling unexpectedly upon the fortified camp of the enemy about midnight and catching them off guard and asleep, he captured Eupolemus himself alive and forced the soldiers to give themselves up. This, then, is what befell the generals who were sent by Cassander into Asia. When Antigonus perceived that Cassander was trying to win Asia for himself, he left his son Demetrius in Syria, ordering him to lie in wait for Ptolemy, whom he suspected of intending to advance from Egypt with an army against Syria. With Demetrius he left an infantry force consisting of 10,000 mercenaries, 2,000 Macedonians, 500 Lycians and Pamphylians, and 400 Persian archers and slingers, a cavalry force of 5,000, and 43 elephants. He assigned to him four counselors, Nearchus of Crete, Pithon, son of Agenor, who had returned a few days before from Babylon, also Andronicus of Olynthus and Philip, men advanced in years who had accompanied Alexander on his whole campaign, for Demetrius was still youthful, being twenty-two years of age. Antigonus himself, taking the rest of the army, first tried to cross the Taurus Range, where he encountered deep snow and lost large numbers of his soldiers. Turning back therefore into Cilicia and seizing another opportunity, he crossed the aforesaid range in greater safety, and, on reaching Selene in Phrygia, he divided his army for wintering. Thereafter he summoned from Phoenicia his fleet under the command of Medius, who fell in with the ships of the Pydnians, thirty-six in number, defeated them in an engagement, and captured the vessels together with their crews. This was the situation in Greece and in Asia. In Sicily those of the Syracusan exiles who were tarrying in Acragas urged the rulers of that city not to watch complacently while Agathocles organized the cities, for it was better, they said, to fight it out of their own free will before the tyrant became strong than to await the increase of his power and then be forced to struggle against him when he had grown stronger. Since they seemed to speak the truth, the popular assembly of the Acragantines voted for the war, added the people of Gela and Messini to the alliance, and sent some of the exiles to Lacedaemon, instructing them to try to bring back a general capable of taking charge of affairs, for they were suspicious of their own statesmen as being inclined toward tyranny, but, remembering the generalship of Timoleon the Corinthian, assumed that leaders from abroad would honestly devote themselves to the common cause. The envoys, when they arrived in Laconia, found that Acrotatus, the son of King Cleomenes, had given offense to many of the younger men and for this reason was eager for activity away from home. This was because, when the Lacedaemonians after the battle against Antipater relieved from ignominy those who had survived the defeat, he alone opposed the decree. He thus gave offense to many others and in particular to those who were subject to the penalties of the laws, indeed, these persons gathered together and gave him a beating, and they were constantly plotting against him. Being therefore anxious for a foreign command, he gladly accepted the invitation of the men from Akragas. Taking his departure from the state without the consent of the ephors, he set sail with a few ships as if to cross to Akragas. He was, however, carried by the winds into the Adriatic and landed in the territory of Apollonia. Finding that city besieged by Glaucias, the king of the Illyrians, he brought the siege to an end, persuading the king to make a treaty with the people of Apollonia. Thence he sailed to Tarentum, where he urged the people to join in freeing the Syracusans, and he persuaded them to vote to assist with twenty ships, for because of ties of kinship and on account of the dignity of his family, they ascribed to his words a high degree of sincerity and great importance. While the Tarentines were engaged in their preparations, Acrotatus immediately sailed to Acragas, where he assumed the office of general. At first, he buoyed up the common people with great expectations and caused all to anticipate a speedy overthrow of the tyrant, however, as time advanced, he accomplished nothing worthy either of his fatherland or of the distinction of his family, but on the contrary, being bloodthirsty and more cruel than the tyrants, he continually gave offense to the common people. Moreover, he abandoned his native manner of living and devoted himself so unrestrainedly to pleasure that he seemed to be a Persian and not a Spartan. 
when he had squandered the larger part of the revenue, partly by his public activity, partly by private peculation, he finally invited to dinner Sosistratus, who was the most distinguished of the exiles and had often commanded armies and treacherously killed him, not having any charge whatever to bring against him and yet being eager to put out of the way a man who was accustomed to act and who was capable of keeping under surveillance those who misused positions of leadership. When this deed became known, the exiles at once began to join forces against Acrotatus, and all the rest were alienated from him. First they removed him from his generalship, and soon afterwards they attempted to stone him, whereupon, terrified by the popular uprising, he took flight by night and sailed secretly to Laconia. After his departure the Tarentines, who had sent their fleet to Sicily, recalled it, and the peoples of Acragas, Gela, and Messini brought their war against Agathocles to an end, Hamilcar the Carthaginian acting as mediator in making the treaty. The chief points of the agreement were as follows, of the Greek towns in Sicily, Heraclea, Salinas, and Himera were to be subject to the Carthaginians as they had been before, and all the others were to be autonomous under the hegemony of Syracuse. Afterwards, however, when Agathocles perceived that Sicily was clear of hostile armies, he began unhampered to subject the cities and strongholds to himself. Mastering many of them quickly, he made his power secure, in fact, he built up for himself a host of allies, ample revenues, and a considerable army. Indeed, without counting the allies and those of the Syracusans who had enlisted for military service, he had picked a mercenary force comprising 10,000 foot soldiers and 3,500 horse. Moreover, he prepared a store of weapons and of missiles of all kinds, since he knew that the Carthaginians, who had censured Hamilcar for the terms of peace, would shortly wage war against him. This was the situation of Sicilian affairs at this time. In Italy the Samnites, fighting bitterly against the Romans for supremacy in a struggle lasting many years, took by siege Plestis, which had a Roman garrison, and persuaded the people of Sora to slay the Romans who were among them and to make an alliance with themselves. Next, as the Romans were besieging Saticula, the Samnites suddenly appeared with a strong army intent on raising the siege. A great battle then took place in which many were slain on both sides, but eventually the Romans gained the upper hand. After the battle the Romans carried the siege of the city to completion and then advanced at will, subjecting the nearby towns and strongholds. Now that the struggle for the cities of Apulia had been joined, the Samnites enrolled all who were of age for military service and encamped near the enemy as if intending to decide the whole issue. When the Roman people learned this, they became anxious about what was impending and sent out a large army. As it was their custom in a dangerous crisis to appoint as military dictator one of their eminent men, they now elected Quintus Fabius and with him Quintus Aulius as master of horse. These, after assuming command of the army, took the field and fought against the Samnites at Lustoli, as it is called, losing many of their soldiers. As panic spread through the whole army, Aulius, in shame at the flight, stood alone against the mass of the enemy, not that he hoped to prevail, but he was maintaining his fatherland undefeated as far as he was concerned. Thus he, by not sharing with his fellow citizens in the disgrace of flight, gained a glorious death for himself alone, but the Romans, fearing that they might completely lose control throughout Apulia, sent a colony to Lyseria, which was the most noteworthy of the cities of that region. Using it as a base, they continued the war against the Samnites, having made no mean provision for their future security, for not only were the Romans victorious in this war because of this city, but also in the wars that have subsequently taken place down to our own time they have continued to use Lyseria as a base of operations against the neighboring peoples, when the activities of this year had come to an end. Theophrastus obtained the archonship in Athens, and Marcus Publius and Gaius. Sulpicius became consuls in Rome. While these were in office, the people of Calantia, who lived on the left side of the Pontus and who were subject to a garrison that had been sent by Lysimachus, drove out this garrison and made an effort to gain autonomy. In like manner, they freed the city of the Istrians and other neighboring cities, and formed an alliance with them binding them to fight together against the prince. They also brought into the alliance those of the Thracians and Scythians whose lands bordered upon their own, so that the whole was a union that had weight and could offer battle with strong forces. As soon, however, as Lysimachus learned what had taken place, he set out against the rebels. After marching through Thrace and crossing the Hemus Mountains, he encamped near Odessus. Beginning a siege, he quickly frightened the inhabitants and took the city by capitulation. Next, after recovering the Istrians in a similar way, he set out against the Calanchians. 
At this very time, the Scythians and the Thracians arrived with large forces to aid their allies in accordance with the treaty. Lysimachus, meeting them and engaging them at once, terrified the Thracians and induced them to change sides, but the Scythians he defeated in a pitched battle, slaying many of them and pursuing the survivors beyond the frontiers. Then, encamping about the city of the Calanchians, he laid siege to it, since he was very eager to chastise in every way those who were responsible for the revolt. While he was thus engaged, there came certain men bringing word that Antigonus had sent two expeditions to the support of the Calanchians, one by land and one by sea, that the general Lycon with the fleet had sailed through into the Pontus, and that Pausanias with a considerable number of soldiers was in camp at a place called Hieron. Perturbed at this, Lysimachus left an adequate body of soldiers to carry on the siege, but with the strongest part of the army he himself pushed on, intent on making contact with the enemy. When, however, he reached the pass over the Hemus, he found Suds, the Thracian king, who had gone over to Antigonus, guarding the crossing with many soldiers. Engaging him in a battle that lasted a considerable time, Lysimachus lost not a few of his own men, but he destroyed a vast number of the enemy and overpowered the barbarians. He also came suddenly upon the forces of Pausanias, catching them after they had taken refuge in a place difficult of access. This he captured, and, after slaying Pausanias, he dismissed some of the soldiers on receiving ransom and enrolled others in his own army. This was the situation of Lysimachus. Antigonus, after he had failed in this undertaking, dispatched Telesphorus into the Peloponnesus, giving him fifty ships and a suitable force of infantry, and he ordered him to free the cities, for he hoped by doing this to establish among the Greeks the belief that he truly was concerned for their independence, and at the same time he gave him a hint to note the activities of Cassander. As soon as Telesphorus had reached port in the Peloponnesus, he advanced upon the cities that were occupied by Alexander's garrisons and freed all of them except Sicyon and Corinth, for in these cities Polyperchon had his quarters, maintaining strong forces and trusting in these and in the strength of the positions. While this was being done, Philip, who had been sent by Cassander to the war against the Aetolians as commander, immediately on arriving in Acarnania with his army undertook to plunder Aetolia, but soon, hearing that Iacides the Eperod had returned to his kingdom and had collected a strong army, he set out very quickly against him, for he was eager to bring the struggle to an end separately before the army of the Aetolians joined forces with the king. Although he found the Epirotes ready for battle, he attacked them at once, slaying many and taking captive no small number, among whom there chanced to be about fifty of those responsible for the return of the king, these he bound and sent to Cassander. As Eacides and his men rallied from the fight and joined the Aetolians, Philip again advanced and overpowered them in battle, slaying many, among whom was King Eacides himself. By gaining such victories a few days Philip so terrified many of the Aetolians that they abandoned their unfortified cities and fled to the most inaccessible of their mountains with their children and their women. Such was the outcome of the campaign in Greece. In Asia, Asander, the ruler of Curia, being hard-pressed by the war, came to terms with Antigonus, agreeing to transfer to him all his soldiers, to relinquish the Greek cities and leave them autonomous, and to hold as a grant the satrapy that he had formerly had, remaining a steadfast friend of Antigonus. Having given his brother Agathon as a hostage for the fulfillment of these terms and then, after a few days having repented of the agreement, he secretly removed his brother from custody and sent emissaries to Ptolemy and Seleucus, begging them to aid him as soon as possible. Antigonus, enraged at this, dispatched a force both by sea and by land to liberate the cities, appointing Medius admiral of the fleet and making Dacimus general of the army. These men, coming to the city of the Milesians, encouraged the citizens to assert their freedom and, after taking by siege the citadel, which was held by a garrison, they restored the independence of the government. While they were thus engaged, Antigonus besieged and took trolleys, then, proceeding to Conus and summoning the fleet, he captured that city also except for its citadel. Investing this, he kept making continuous attacks on the side where it was most easily assailed. Ptolemaeus, who had been sent to Iasus with an adequate force, compelled that city to support Antigonus. In this way, then, these cities, which were in Curia, were made subject to Antigonus. A few days later, when ambassadors came to the latter from the Aetolians and the Boeotians, he made an alliance with them, but, when he entered into negotiations with Cassander about peace in the Hellespontine region, he accomplished nothing since they could in no way agree. For this reason, Cassander gave up hope of settlement and decided to play a part once more in the affairs of Greece. 
setting out for Aureus, therefore, with thirty ships, he laid siege to the city. While he was vigorously attacking and was already at the point of taking the city by storm, reinforcements appeared for the people of Aureus, Telesphorus from the Peloponnesus with twenty ships and a thousand soldiers, and Medius from Asia with a hundred ships. They saw the ships of Cassander blockading the harbor and threw fire into them, burning for and almost destroying them all, but when reinforcements for the defeated came from Athens, Cassander sailed out against the enemy, who were off their guard. When they met, he sank one ship and seized three with their crews. Such were the activities in Greece and the Pontus. In Italy, the Samnites were advancing with a large army, destroying whatever cities in Campania were supporting their enemies, and the Roman consuls, coming up with an army, were trying to aid those of their allies who were in danger. They took the field against the enemy near Terracina and at once relieved that city from its immediate fears, then a few days later, when both sides had drawn up their armies, a hard-fought battle took place and very many fell on both sides. Finally the Romans, pressing on with all their strength, got the better of their enemies and, pushing the pursuit for a long time, slew more than ten thousand. While this battle was still unknown to them, the Campanians, scorning the Romans, rose in rebellion, but the people at once sent an adequate force against them with the dictator Gaius Manius as commander and accompanying him, according to the national custom, Manius Fulvius as master of horse. When these were in position near Capua, the Campanians at first endeavored to fight, but afterwards, hearing of the defeat of the Samnites and believing that all the forces would come against themselves, they made terms with the Romans. They surrendered those guilty of the uprising, who without awaiting the judgment of the trial that was instituted, killed themselves. But the cities gained pardon and were reinstated in their former alliance. When this year had passed, Polmon was archon in Athens, and in Rome the consuls were Lucius Papirius for the fifth time and Gaius Iunius, and in this year the Olympic Games were celebrated for the 117th time, Parmenian of Mytilene winning the footrace. In this year Antigonus ordered his general Ptolemaeus into Greece to set the Greeks free and sent with him 150 warships, placing Medius in command of them as admiral and an army of 5,000 foot and 500 horse. Antigonus also made an alliance with the Rhodians and received from them, for the liberation of the Greeks, ten ships fully equipped for war. Ptolemaeus, putting in with the entire fleet at the harbor of Boeotia known as Bathys, received from the Boeotian lead 2,200 foot soldiers and 1,300 horse. He also summoned his ships from Aureus, fortified Salganius, and gathered there his entire force, for he hoped to be admitted by the Chalcidians, who alone of the Eubians were garrisoned by the enemy. But Cassander, in his anxiety for Chalcis, gave up the siege of Aureus, moved to Chalcis, and summoned his forces. When Antigonus heard that in Euboea the armed forces were watching each other, he recalled Medius to Asia with the fleet, and at once with his army set out at top speed for the Hellespont as if intending to cross over into Macedonia, in order that, if Cassander remained in Euboea, he might himself occupy Macedonia while it was stripped of defenders, or that Cassander, going to the defense of his kingdom, might lose his supremacy in Greece. But Cassander, perceiving Antigonus' plan, left Plistarchus in command of the garrison in Chalcis and setting out himself with all his forces took Oropus by storm and brought the Thebans into his alliance. Then, after making a truce with the other Boeotians and leaving Eupolemus as general for Greece, he went into Macedonia, for he was apprehensive of the enemy's crossing. As for Antigonus, when he came to the Propontis, he sent an embassy to the Byzantines, asking them to enter the alliance. But there had arrived envoys from Lysimachus also who were urging them to do nothing against either Lysimachus or Cassander, and the Byzantines decided to remain neutral and to maintain peace and friendship toward both parties. Antigonus, because he had been foiled in these undertakings and also because the winter season was closing in upon him, distributed his soldiers among the cities for the winter. While these things were going on, the Corsarians, who had gone to the aid of the people of Apollonia and Epidamnus, dismissed Cassander's soldiers under a truce, and of these cities they freed Apollonia, but Epidamnus they gave over to Glaucias, the king of the Illyrians. After Cassander had departed for Macedonia, Antigonus' general Ptolemaeus, striking fear into the garrison that was holding Chalcis, took the city, and he left the Chalcidians without a garrison in order to make it evident that Antigonus in very truth proposed to free the Greeks, for the city is well placed for any who wish to have a base from which to carry through a war for supremacy. However that may be, when Ptolemaeus had taken Oropus by siege, he gave it back to the Boeotians and made captive the troops of Cassander. 
Thereafter, having received the people of Eritrea and Charistus into the alliance, he moved into Attica, where Demetrius of Phalerum was governing the city. At first the Athenians kept sending secretly to Antigonus, begging him to free the city, but then, taking courage when Ptolemaeus drew near the city, they forced Demetrius to make a truce and to send envoys to Antigonus about an alliance. Ptolemaeus, moving from Attica into Boeotia, took the Cadmea, drove out the garrison, and freed Thebes. After this, he advanced into Phocis, where he won over most of the cities, and from all of these expelled the garrisons of Cassander. He also marched against Locris, and, since the Opuntians belonged to the party of Cassander, he began a siege and made continuous attacks. In that same summer the people of Cyrene revolted from Ptolemy, invested the citadel, and seemed on the point of immediately casting out the garrison, and, when envoys came from Alexandria and bade them cease from their sedition, they killed them and continued the attack on the citadel with greater vigor. Enraged at them, Ptolemy dispatched Aegis as general with a land army and also sent a fleet to take part in the war, placing Epinetus in command. Aegis attacked the rebels with vigor and took the city by storm. Those who were guilty of the sedition he bound and sent to Alexandria, and then, after depriving the others of their arms and arranging the affairs of the city in whatever way seemed best to himself, he returned to Egypt. But Ptolemy, now that the matter of Cyrene had been disposed of according to his wishes, crossed over with an army from Egypt into Cyprus against those of the kings who refused to obey him. Finding that Pygmalion was negotiating with Antigonus, he put him to death, and he arrested Praxippus, king of Lapithia and ruler of Cyrenia, whom he suspected of being ill-disposed toward himself, and also Stasiacus, ruler of Marion, destroying the city and transporting the inhabitants to Paphos. After accomplishing these things, he appointed Nicocreon as general of Cyprus, giving him both the cities and the revenues of the kings who had been driven out, but he himself with his army, sailing toward Upper Syria, as it is called, captured and sacked Posidium and Potami Karen. Sailing without delay to Cilicia, he took malice and sold as booty those who were captured there. He also plundered the neighboring territory and, after sating his army with spoil, sailed back to Cyprus. His playing up to the soldiers in this way was designed to evoke enthusiasm in face of the encounters that were approaching. Now Antigonus' son Demetrius was staying on in Coel Syria lying in wait for the Egyptian armies. But when he heard of the capture of the cities, he left Pithon as general in charge of the region, giving him the elephants and the heavy-armed units of the army, and he himself, taking the cavalry and the light-armed units, moved rapidly towards Cilicia to give aid to those who were in danger. Arriving after the opportunity had passed and finding that the enemy had sailed away, he went rapidly back to his camp, having lost most of his horses during the march, for in six days' march towards Malice he covered twenty-four stages, with the result that on account of the excessive hardship not one of his settlers or of his grooms kept up the pace. Ptolemy, since his undertakings had turned out as he wished, now sailed away to Egypt, but after a little while, spurred on by Seleucus because of his hostility toward Antigonus, he decided to make a campaign into Coel Syria and take the field against the army of Demetrius. He therefore gathered together his forces from all sides and marched from Alexandria to Pelusium with 18,000 foot and 4,000 horse. Of his army some were Macedonians and some were mercenaries, but a great number were Egyptians, of whom some carried the missiles and the other baggage, but some were armed and serviceable for battle. Marching through the desert from Pelusium, he camped near the enemy at Old Gaza in Syria. Demetrius, who had likewise summoned his soldiers to Old Gaza from their winter quarters on all sides, awaited the approach of his opponents. Afterwards, however, when Agathocles perceived that Sicily was clear of hostile armies, he began unhampered to subject the cities and strongholds to himself. Mastering many of them quickly, he made his power secure, in fact, he built up for himself a host of allies, ample revenues, and a considerable army. Indeed, without counting the allies and those of the Syracusans who had enlisted for military service, he had picked a mercenary force comprising 10,000 foot soldiers and 3,500 horse. Moreover, he prepared a store of weapons and of missiles of all kinds, since he knew that the Carthaginians, who had censured Hamilcar for the terms of peace, would shortly wage war against him. This was the situation of Sicilian affairs at this time. In Italy the Samnites, fighting bitterly against the Romans for supremacy in a struggle lasting many years, took by siege Plestis, which had a Roman garrison, and persuaded the people of Sora to slay the Romans who were among them and to make an alliance with themselves. 
Next, as the Romans were besieging Saticula, the Samnites suddenly appeared with a strong army intent on raising the siege. A great battle then took place in which many were slain on both sides, but eventually the Romans gained the upper hand. After the battle the Romans carried the siege of the city to completion and then advanced at will, subjecting the nearby towns and strongholds. Now that the struggle for the cities of Apulia had been joined, the Samnites enrolled all who were of age for military service and encamped near the enemy as if intending to decide the whole issue. When the Roman people learned this, they became anxious about what was impending and sent out a large army. As it was their custom in a dangerous crisis to appoint as military dictator one of their eminent men, they now elected Quintus Fabius and with him Quintus Aulius as master of horse. These, after assuming command of the army, took the field and fought against the Samnites at Lustoli, as it is called, losing many of their soldiers. As panic spread through the whole army, Aulius, in shame at the flight, stood alone against the mass of the enemy, not that he hoped to prevail, but he was maintaining his fatherland undefeated as far as he was concerned. Thus he, by not sharing with his fellow citizens in the disgrace of flight, gained a glorious death for himself alone, but the Romans, fearing that they might completely lose control throughout Apulia, sent a colony to Lyseria, which was the most noteworthy of the cities of that region. Using it as a base, they continued the war against the Samnites, having made no mean provision for their future security, for not only were the Romans victorious in this war because of this city, but also in the wars that have subsequently taken place down to our own time they have continued to use Lyseria as a base of operations against the neighboring peoples, when the activities of this year had come to an end. Theophrastus obtained the archonship in Athens, and Marcus Publius and Gaius. Sulpicius became consuls in Rome. While these were in office, the people of Calantia, who lived on the left side of the Pontus and who were subject to a garrison that had been sent by Lysimachus, drove out this garrison and made an effort to gain autonomy. In like manner, they freed the city of the Istrians and other neighboring cities, and formed an alliance with them binding them to fight together against the prince. They also brought into the alliance those of the Thracians and Scythians whose lands bordered upon their own, so that the whole was a union that had weight and could offer battle with strong forces. As soon, however, as Lysimachus learned what had taken place, he set out against the rebels. After marching through Thrace and crossing the Hemus Mountains, he encamped near Odessus. Beginning a siege, he quickly frightened the inhabitants and took the city by capitulation. Next, after recovering the Istrians in a similar way, he set out against the Calanchians. At this very time, the Scythians and the Thracians arrived with large forces to aid their allies in accordance with the treaty. Lysimachus, meeting them and engaging them at once, terrified the Thracians and induced them to change sides, but the Scythians he defeated in a pitched battle, slaying many of them and pursuing the survivors beyond the frontiers. Then, encamping about the city of the Calanchians, he laid siege to it, since he was very eager to chastise in every way those who were responsible for the revolt. While he was thus engaged, there came certain men bringing word that Antigonus had sent two expeditions to the support of the Calanchians, one by land and one by sea, that the general Lycon with the fleet had sailed through into the Pontus, and that Pausanias with a considerable number of soldiers was in camp at a place called Hieron. Perturbed at this, Lysimachus left an adequate body of soldiers to carry on the siege, but with the strongest part of the army he himself pushed on, intent on making contact with the enemy. When, however, he reached the pass over the Hemus, he found Suths, the Thracian king, who had gone over to Antigonus, guarding the crossing with many soldiers. Engaging him in a battle that lasted a considerable time, Lysimachus lost not a few of his own men, but he destroyed a vast number of the enemy and overpowered the barbarians. He also came suddenly upon the forces of Pausanias, catching them after they had taken refuge in a place difficult of access. This he captured, and, after slaying Pausanias, he dismissed some of the soldiers on receiving ransom and enrolled others in his own army. This was the situation of Lysimachus. Antigonus, after he had failed in this undertaking, dispatched Telesphorus into the Peloponnesus, giving him fifty ships and a suitable force of infantry, and he ordered him to free the cities, for he hoped by doing this to establish among the Greeks the belief that he truly was concerned for their independence, and at the same time he gave him a hint to note the activities of Cassander. 
As soon as Telesphorus had reached port in the Peloponnesus, he advanced upon the cities that were occupied by Alexander's garrisons and freed all of them except Sicyon and Corinth, for in these cities Polyperchon had his quarters, maintaining strong forces and trusting in these and in the strength of the positions. While this was being done, Philip, who had been sent by Cassander to the war against the Aetolians as commander, immediately on arriving in Acarnania with his army undertook to plunder Aetolia, but soon, hearing that Iacides the Eperod had returned to his kingdom and had collected a strong army, he set out very quickly against him, for he was eager to bring the struggle to an end separately before the army of the Aetolians joined forces with the king. Although he found the Epirotes ready for battle, he attacked them at once, slaying many and taking captive no small number, among whom there chanced to be about fifty of those responsible for the return of the king, these he bound and sent to Cassander. As Eacides and his men rallied from the fight and joined the Aetolians, Philip again advanced and overpowered them in battle, slaying many, among whom was King Eacides himself. By gaining such victories a few days Philip so terrified many of the Aetolians that they abandoned their unfortified cities and fled to the most inaccessible of their mountains with their children and their women. Such was the outcome of the campaign in Greece. In Asia, Asander, the ruler of Curia, being hard-pressed by the war, came to terms with Antigonus, agreeing to transfer to him all his soldiers, to relinquish the Greek cities and leave them autonomous, and to hold as a grant the satrapy that he had formerly had, remaining a steadfast friend of Antigonus. Having given his brother Agathon as a hostage for the fulfillment of these terms and then, after a few days having repented of the agreement, he secretly removed his brother from custody and sent emissaries to Ptolemy and Seleucus, begging them to aid him as soon as possible. Antigonus, enraged at this, dispatched a force both by sea and by land to liberate the cities, appointing Medius admiral of the fleet and making Dacimus general of the army. These men, coming to the city of the Milesians, encouraged the citizens to assert their freedom and, after taking by siege the citadel, which was held by a garrison, they restored the independence of the government. While they were thus engaged, Antigonus besieged and took trolleys, then, proceeding to Conus and summoning the fleet, he captured that city also except for its citadel. Investing this, he kept making continuous attacks on the side where it was most easily assailed. Ptolemaeus, who had been sent to Iasus with an adequate force, compelled that city to support Antigonus. In this way, then, these cities, which were in Curia, were made subject to Antigonus. A few days later, when ambassadors came to the latter from the Aetolians and the Boeotians, he made an alliance with them, but, when he entered into negotiations with Cassander about peace in the Hellespontine region, he accomplished nothing since they could in no way agree. For this reason, Cassander gave up hope of settlement and decided to play a part once more in the affairs of Greece. Setting out for Aureus, therefore, with thirty ships, he laid siege to the city. While he was vigorously attacking and was already at the point of taking the city by storm, reinforcements appeared for the people of Aureus, Telesphorus from the Peloponnesus with twenty ships and a thousand soldiers, and Medius from Asia with a hundred ships. They saw the ships of Cassander blockading the harbor and threw fire into them, burning for and almost destroying them all, but when reinforcements for the defeated came from Athens, Cassander sailed out against the enemy, who were off their guard. When they met, he sank one ship and seized three with their crews. Such were the activities in Greece and the Pontus. In Italy, the Samnites were advancing with a large army, destroying whatever cities in Campania were supporting their enemies, and the Roman consuls, coming up with an army, were trying to aid those of their allies who were in danger. They took the field against the enemy near Terracina and at once relieved that city from its immediate fears, then a few days later, when both sides had drawn up their armies, a hard-fought battle took place and very many fell on both sides. Finally the Romans, pressing on with all their strength, got the better of their enemies and, pushing the pursuit for a long time, slew more than ten thousand. While this battle was still unknown to them, the Campanians, scorning the Romans, rose in rebellion, but the people at once sent an adequate force against them with the dictator Gaius Manius as commander and accompanying him, according to the national custom, Manius Fulvius as master of horse. When these were in position near Capua, the Campanians at first endeavored to fight, but afterwards, hearing of the defeat of the Samnites and believing that all the forces would come against themselves, they made terms with the Romans. They surrendered those guilty of the uprising, who without awaiting the judgment of the trial that was instituted, killed themselves. But the cities gained pardon and were reinstated in their former alliance. 
When this year had passed, Polmon was archon in Athens, and in Rome the consuls were Lucius Papirius for the fifth time and Gaius Iunius, and in this year the Olympic Games were celebrated for the 117th time, Parmenian of Mytilene winning the foot race. In this year Antigonus ordered his general Ptolemaeus into Greece to set the Greeks free and sent with him 150 warships, placing Medius in command of them as admiral and an army of 5,000 foot and 500 horse. Antigonus also made an alliance with the Rhodians and received from them for the liberation of the Greeks ten ships fully equipped for war. Ptolemaeus, putting in with the entire fleet at the harbor of Boeotia known as Bathys, received from the Boeotian lead 2,200 foot soldiers and 1,300 horse. He also summoned his ships from Aureus, fortified Salganius, and gathered there his entire force, for he hoped to be admitted by the Chalcidians, who alone of the Eubians were garrisoned by the enemy. But Cassander, in his anxiety for Chalcis, gave up the siege of Aureus, moved to Chalcis, and summoned his forces. When Antigonus heard that in Euboea the armed forces were watching each other, he recalled Medius to Asia with the fleet, and at once with his army set out at top speed for the Hellespont as if intending to cross over into Macedonia, in order that, if Cassander remained in Euboea, he might himself occupy Macedonia while it was stripped of defenders, or that Cassander, going to the defense of his kingdom, might lose his supremacy in Greece. But Cassander, perceiving Antigonus' plan, left Plistarchus in command of the garrison in Chalcis and setting out himself with all his forces took Oropus by storm and brought the Thebans into his alliance. Then, after making a truce with the other Boeotians and leaving Eupolemus as general for Greece, he went into Macedonia, for he was apprehensive of the enemy's crossing. As for Antigonus, when he came to the Propontis, he sent an embassy to the Byzantines, asking them to enter the alliance. But there had arrived envoys from Lysimachus also who were urging them to do nothing against either Lysimachus or Cassander, and the Byzantines decided to remain neutral and to maintain peace and friendship toward both parties. Antigonus, because he had been foiled in these undertakings and also because the winter season was closing in upon him, distributed his soldiers among the cities for the winter. While these things were going on, the Corsarians, who had gone to the aid of the people of Apollonia and Epidamnus, dismissed Cassander's soldiers under a truce, and of these cities they freed Apollonia, but Epidamnus they gave over to Glaucias, the king of the Illyrians. After Cassander had departed for Macedonia, Antigonus' general Ptolemaeus, striking fear into the garrison that was holding Chalcis, took the city, and he left the Chalcidians without a garrison in order to make it evident that Antigonus in very truth proposed to free the Greeks, for the city is well placed for any who wish to have a base from which to carry through a war for supremacy. However that may be, when Ptolemaeus had taken Oropus by siege, he gave it back to the Boeotians and made captive the troops of Cassander. Thereafter, having received the people of Eritrea and Charistus into the alliance, he moved into Attica, where Demetrius of Phalerum was governing the city. At first the Athenians kept sending secretly to Antigonus, begging him to free the city, but then, taking courage when Ptolemaeus drew near the city, they forced Demetrius to make a truce and to send envoys to Antigonus about an alliance. Ptolemaeus, moving from Attica into Boeotia, took the Cadmea, drove out the garrison, and freed Thebes. After this, he advanced into Phocis, where he won over most of the cities, and from all of these expelled the garrisons of Cassander. He also marched against Locris, and, since the Opuntians belonged to the party of Cassander, he began a siege and made continuous attacks. In that same summer the people of Cyrene revolted from Ptolemy, invested the citadel, and seemed on the point of immediately casting out the garrison, and, when envoys came from Alexandria and bade them cease from their sedition, they killed them and continued the attack on the citadel with greater vigor. Enraged at them, Ptolemy dispatched Aegis as general with a land army and also sent a fleet to take part in the war, placing Epinetus in command. Aegis attacked the rebels with vigor and took the city by storm. Those who were guilty of the sedition he bound and sent to Alexandria, and then, after depriving the others of their arms and arranging the affairs of the city in whatever way seemed best to himself, he returned to Egypt. But Ptolemy, now that the matter of Cyrene had been disposed of according to his wishes, crossed over with an army from Egypt into Cyprus against those of the kings who refused to obey him. Finding that Pygmalion was negotiating with Antigonus, he put him to death, and he arrested Praxippus, king of Lapithia and ruler of Cyrenia, whom he suspected of being ill-disposed toward himself, and also Stasiacus, ruler of Marion, destroying the city and transporting the inhabitants to Paphos. 
After accomplishing these things, he appointed Nicocrian as general of Cyprus, giving him both the cities and the revenues of the kings who had been driven out, but he himself with his army, sailing toward Upper Syria, as it is called, captured and sacked Posidium and Potami Karen. Sailing without delay to Cilicia, he took malice and sold as booty those who were captured there. He also plundered the neighboring territory and, after sating his army with spoil, sailed back to Cyprus. His playing up to the soldiers in this way was designed to evoke enthusiasm in face of the encounters that were approaching. Now Antigonus' son Demetrius was staying on in Coel Syria lying in wait for the Egyptian armies. But when he heard of the capture of the cities, he left Pithon as general in charge of the region, giving him the elephants and the heavy-armed units of the army, and he himself, taking the cavalry and the light-armed units, moved rapidly towards Cilicia to give aid to those who were in danger. Arriving after the opportunity had passed and finding that the enemy had sailed away, he went rapidly back to his camp, having lost most of his horses during the march, for in six days' march towards Malice he covered twenty-four stages, with the result that on account of the excessive hardship not one of his settlers or of his grooms kept up the pace. Ptolemy, since his undertakings had turned out as he wished, now sailed away to Egypt, but after a little while, spurred on by Seleucus because of his hostility toward Antigonus, he decided to make a campaign into Coel Syria and take the field against the army of Demetrius. He therefore gathered together his forces from all sides and marched from Alexandria to Pelusium with 18,000 foot and 4,000 horse. Of his army some were Macedonians and some were mercenaries, but a great number were Egyptians, of whom some carried the missiles and the other baggage, but some were armed and serviceable for battle. Marching through the desert from Pelusium, he camped near the enemy at Old Gaza in Syria. Demetrius, who had likewise summoned his soldiers to Old Gaza from their winter quarters on all sides, awaited the approach of his opponents. But when Nicanor, the general in Media, gathered about him from Media and Persia and the neighboring lands more than 10,000 foot soldiers and about 7,000 horse, Seleucus set out at full speed to oppose the enemy. He himself had an all more than 3,000 foot and 400 horse. He crossed the Tigris River and, on hearing that the enemy were a few days' march distant, he hid his soldiers in the adjacent marshes, intending to make his attack a surprise. When Nicanor arrived at the Tigris River and did not find the enemy, he camped at one of the royal stations, believing that they had fled to a greater distance than was the case. When night was come and the army of Nicanor was keeping a perfunctory and negligent guard, Seleucus fell on them suddenly, causing great confusion and panic, for it happened that when the Persians had joined battle, their satrap of Ager fell together with some of the other leaders. When this occurred, most of the soldiers went over to Seleucus, in part because they were frightened at the danger but in part because they were offended by the conduct of Antigonus. Nicanor, who was left with only a few men and feared lest he be delivered over to the enemy, took flight with his friends through the desert. But Seleucus, now that he had gained control of a large army and was comporting himself in a way gracious to all, easily won over Susan, Media, and some of the adjacent lands, and he wrote to Ptolemy and his other friends about his achievements, already possessing a king's stature and a reputation worthy of royal power. Meanwhile, Ptolemy remained in Coel Syria after having conquered Antigonus' son Demetrius in a great battle. On hearing that Demetrius had returned from Cilicia and was encamped in Upper Syria, he chose from the friends who were with him Sils the Macedonian, and, giving him an adequate army, he ordered him to drive Demetrius completely out of Syria or to entrap and crush him. While Sils was on the way, Demetrius, hearing from spies that he was carelessly encamped at Myus, left his baggage behind and with his soldiers and light equipment made a forced march, then, falling suddenly upon the enemy during the early morning watch, he captured the army without a battle and took the general himself prisoner. By achieving such a success, he believed that he had wiped out the defeat. Nevertheless, assuming that Ptolemy would march against him with all his army, he went into camp, using as the outworks of his defense swamps and marshes. He also wrote to his father about the success that had been gained, urging him either to send an army as soon as possible or to cross over into Syria himself. Antigonus chanced to be in Selene in Phrygia, and, on receiving the letter, he rejoiced greatly that his son, young as he was, seemed to have got out of his difficulties by himself and to have shown himself worthy to be a king. He himself with his army set out from Phrygia, crossed the Taurus, and within a few days joined Demetrius. 
Ptolemy, however, on hearing of the arrival of Antigonus, called together his leaders and friends and took counsel with them whether it was better to remain and reach a final decision in Syria or to withdraw to Egypt and carry on the war from there as he had formerly done against Perdiccas. Now all advised him not to risk a battle against an army that was many times stronger and had a larger number of elephants as well as against an unconquered general, for, they said, it would be much easier for him to settle the war in Egypt where he had plenty of supplies and could trust to the difficulty of the terrain. Deciding, therefore, to leave Syria, he raised the most noteworthy of the cities that he had captured, Achan Phoenician Syria, and Iop, Samaria, and Gaza in Syria, then he himself, taking the army and what of the booty it was possible to drive or carry, returned into Egypt. Now that Antigonus without a fight had gained possession of all Syria and Phoenicia, he desired to make a campaign against the land of the Arabs who are called Nabataeans. Deciding that this people was hostile to his interests, he selected one of his friends, Athenaeus, gave him four thousand light foot soldiers and six hundred horsemen fitted for speed, and ordered him to set upon the barbarians suddenly and cut off all their cattle as booty. For the sake of those who do not know, it will be useful to state in some detail the customs of these Arabs, by following which, it is believed, they preserve their liberty. They live in the open air, claiming as native land a wilderness that has neither rivers nor abundant springs from which it is possible for a hostile army to obtain water. It is their custom neither to plant grain, set out any fruit-bearing tree, use wine, nor construct any house, and if anyone is found acting contrary to this, death is his penalty. They follow this custom because they believe that those who possess these things are, in order to retain the use of them, easily compelled by the powerful to do their bidding. Some of them raise camels, other sheep, pasturing them in the desert. While there are many Arabian tribes who use the desert as pasture, the Nabataeans far surpass the others in wealth, although they are not much more than 10,000 in number, for not a few of them are accustomed to bring down to the sea frankincense and myrrh and the most valuable kinds of spices, which they procure from those who convey them from what is called Arabia Eudaemon. They are exceptionally fond of freedom, and, whenever a strong force of enemies comes near, they take refuge in the desert, using this as a fortress, for it lacks water and cannot be crossed by others, but to them alone, since they have prepared subterranean reservoirs lined with stucco, it furnishes safety. As the earth in some places is clay and in others is of soft stone, they make great excavations in it, the mouths of which they make very small, but by constantly increasing the width as they dig deeper, they finally make them of such size that each side has a length of one plethrum. After filling these reservoirs with rain water, they close the openings, making them even with the rest of the ground, and they leave signs that are known to themselves but are unrecognizable by others. They water their cattle every other day, so that, if they flee through waterless places, they may not need a continuous supply of water. They themselves use as food flesh and milk and those of the plants that grow from the ground which are suitable for this purpose, for among them there grow the pepper and plenty of the so-called wild honey from trees, which they drink mixed with water. There are also other tribes of Arabs, some of whom even till the soil, mingling with the tribute-paying peoples, and have the same customs as the Syrians, except that they do not dwell in houses. It appears that such are the customs of the Arabs. But when the time draws near for the national gathering at which those who dwell round about are accustomed to meet, some to sell goods and others to purchase things that are needful to them, they travel to this meeting, leaving on a certain rock their possessions and their old men, also their women and their children. This place is exceedingly strong but unwalled, and it is distant two days' journey from the settled country. After waiting for this season, Athenaeus set out for the rock with his army in light marching order. Covering the 2200 states from the district of Idumea in three days and the same number of nights, he escaped the attention of the Arabs and seized the rock at about midnight. Of those that were caught there, some he slew at once, some he took as prisoners, and others who were wounded he left behind, and of the frankincense and myrrh he gathered together the larger part and about 500 talents of silver. Delaying no longer than the early morning watch, he at once departed at top speed, expecting to be pursued by the barbarians. When he and his men had marched without pause for two hundred stades, they made camp, being tired and keeping a careless watch as if they believed that the enemy could not come before two or three days. But when the Arabs heard from those who had seen the expedition, they at once gathered together and, leaving the place of assembly, came to the rock, then, being informed by the wounded of what had taken place, they pursued the Greeks at top speed. 
while the men of Athenaeus were encamped with little thought of the enemy and because of their weariness were deep in sleep, some of their prisoners escaped secretly, and the Nabataeans, learning from them the condition of the enemy, attacked the camp at about the third watch, being no less than eight thousand in number. Most of the hostile troops they slaughtered where they lay, the rest they slew with their javelins as they awoke and sprang to arms. In the end all the foot soldiers were slain, but of the horsemen about fifty escaped, and of these the larger part were wounded. And so Athenaeus, after being successful at first, later because of his own folly failed in this manner, for carelessness and indifference are, in general, want to follow success. For this reason some rightly believe that it is easier to meet disaster with skill than very great success with discretion, for disaster, because of the fear of what is to follow, forces men to be careful, but success, because of the previous good fortune, tempts men to be careless about everything. When the Nabataeans had manfully punished the enemy they themselves returned to the rock with the property that they had recovered, but to Antigonus they wrote a letter in Syrian characters in which they accused Athenaeus and vindicated themselves. Antigonus replied to them, agreeing that they had been justified in defending themselves, but he found fault with Athenaeus, saying that he had made the attack contrary to the instructions that had been given. He did this, hiding his own intentions and desiring to delude the barbarians into a sense of security so that, by making an unexpected attack, he might accomplish his desire, for it was not easy without some deception to get the better of men who zealously pursued a nomadic life and possessed the desert as an inaccessible refuge. The Arabs were highly pleased because they seemed to have been relieved of great fears, yet they did not altogether trust the words of Antigonus, but, regarding their prospects as uncertain, they placed watchmen upon the hills from which it was easy to see from a distance the passes into Arabia, and they themselves, after having arranged their affairs in proper fashion, anxiously awaited the issue. But Antigonus, when he had treated the barbarians as friends for some time and believed that they had been thoroughly deceived and thus had given him his opportunity against themselves, selected from his whole force four thousand foot soldiers, who were lightly armed and well fitted by nature for rapid marching, and more than four thousand mounted men. He ordered them to carry several days' supply of food that would not require cooking, and, after placing his son Demetrius in command, he sent them off during the first watch, ordering him to punish the Arabs in whatever way he could. Demetrius, therefore, advanced for three days through regions with no roads, striving not to be observed by the barbarians, but the lookouts, having seen that a hostile force had entered, informed the Nabataeans by means of prearranged fire signals. The barbarians, having thus learned at once that the Greeks had come, sent their property to the rock and posted there a garrison that was strong enough since there was a single artificial approach, and they themselves divided their flocks and drove them into the desert, some into one place and some into another. Demetrius, on arriving at the rock and finding that the flocks had been removed, made repeated assaults upon the stronghold. Those within resisted stoutly, and easily had the upper hand because of the height of the place, and so on this day, after he had continued the struggle until evening, he recalled his soldiers by a trumpet call. On the next day, however, when he had advanced upon the rock, one of the barbarians called to him, saying, King Demetrius, with what desire or under what compulsion do you war against us who live in the desert and in a land that has neither water nor grain nor wine nor any other thing whatever of those that pertain to the necessities of life among you? For we, since we are in no way willing to be slaves, have all taken refuge in a land that lacks all the things that are valued among other peoples, and have chosen to live a life in the desert and one altogether like that of wild beasts, harming you not at all. We therefore beg both you and your father to do us no injury but, after receiving gifts from us, to withdraw your army and henceforth regard the Nabataeans as your friends. For neither can you, if you wish, remain here many days since you lack water and all the other necessary supplies, nor can you force us to live a different life, but you will have a few captives, disheartened slaves who would not consent to live among strange ways. When words such as these had been spoken, Demetrius withdrew his army and ordered the Arabs to send an embassy about these matters. They sent their oldest men, who, repeating arguments similar to those previously uttered, persuaded him to receive as gifts the most precious of their products and to make terms with them. Degree Demetrius received hostages and the gifts that had been agreed upon and departed from the rock. After marching for three hundred stades, he camped near the Dead Sea, the nature of which ought not to be passed over without remark. It lies along the middle of the satrapy of Idumea, extending in length about five hundred stades and in width about sixty. Its water is very bitter and of exceedingly foul odor, so that it can support neither fish nor any of the other creatures usually found in water. 
Although great rivers whose waters are of exceptional sweetness flow into it, it prevails over these by reason of its foulness, and from its center each year it sends forth a mass of solid asphalt, sometimes more than three plethora in area, sometimes a little less than one plethora. When this happens the barbarians who live near habitually call the larger mass a bull and the smaller one a calf. When the asphalt is floating on the sea, its surface seems to those who see it from a distance, just like an island. It appears that the ejection of the asphalt is indicated twenty days in advance, for on every side about the sea for a distance of many states the odor of the asphalt spreads with a noisome exhalation, and all the silver, gold, and bronze in the region lose their proper colors. These, however, are restored as soon as all the asphalt has been ejected, but the neighboring region is very torrid and ill-smelling, which makes the inhabitants sickly in body and exceedingly short-lived. Yet the land is good for raising palm trees in whatever part it is crossed by serviceable rivers or is supplied with springs that can irrigate it. In a certain valley in this region there grows what is called balsam, from which there is a great income since nowhere else in the inhabited world is this plant found, and its use as a drug is very important to physicians. When the asphalt has been ejected, the people who live about the sea on both sides carry it off like plunder of war since they are hostile to each other, making the collection without boats in a peculiar fashion. They make ready large bundles of reeds and cast them into the sea. On these not more than three men take their places, two of whom row with oars, which are lashed on, but one carries a bow and repels any who sail against them from the other shore or who venture to interfere with them. When they have come near the asphalt they jump upon it with axes and, just as it were soft stone, they cut out pieces and load them on the raft, after which they sail back. If the raft comes to pieces and one of them who does not know how to swim falls off, he does not sink as he would in other waters, but stays afloat as well as do those who know. For this liquid by its nature supports heavy bodies that have the power of growth or of breathing, except for solid ones that seem to have a density like that of silver, gold, lead, and the like, and even these sink much more slowly than do these exact bodies if they are cast into other lakes. The barbarians who enjoy this source of income take the asphalt to Egypt and sell it for the embalming of the dead, for unless this is mixed with the other aromatic ingredients, the preservation of the bodies cannot be permanent. Antigonus, when Demetrius returned and made a detailed report of what he had done, rebuked him for the treaty with the Nabataeans, saying that he had made the barbarians much bolder by leaving them unpunished, since it would seem to them that they had gained pardon not through his kindness but through his inability to overcome them. But he praised him for examining the lake and apparently having found a source of revenue for the kingdom. In charge of this he placed Hieronymus, the writer of the history, and instructed him to prepare boats, collect all the asphalt, and bring it together in a certain place. But the result was not in accord with the expectations of Antigonus, for the Arabs, collecting to the number of six thousand and sailing up on their rafts of reeds against those on the boats, killed almost all of them with their arrows. As a result, Antigonus gave up this source of revenue because of the defeat he had suffered and because his mind was engaged with other and weightier matters. For there came to him at this time a dispatch-bearer with a letter from Nicanor, the general of Media and the upper satrapies. In this letter was written an account of Seleucus' march inland and of the disasters that had been suffered in connection with him. Therefore Antigonus, worried about the upper satrapies, sent his son Demetrius with five thousand Macedonian and ten thousand mercenary foot soldiers and four thousand horse, and he ordered him to go up as far as Babylon and then, after recovering the satrapy, to come down to the sea at full speed. So Demetrius, having set out from Damascus in Syria, carried out his father's orders with zeal. Patricles, who had been established as general of Babylonia by Seleucus, hearing that the enemy was on the frontiers of Mesopotamia, did not dare await their arrival since he had few men at hand, but he gave orders to the civilians to leave the city, bidding some of them cross the Euphrates and take refuge in the desert and some of them pass over the Tigris and go into Susan to Utiles and to the Red Sea, and he himself with what soldiers he had, using river courses and canals as defenses kept moving about in the satrapy, watching the enemy and at the same time sending word into media to Seleucus about what was taking place from time to time and urging him to send aid as soon as possible. When Demetrius on his arrival at Babylon found the city abandoned, he began to besiege the citadels. He took one of these and delivered it to his own soldiers for plundering, the other he besieged for a few days and then, since the capture required time, left Archelaus, one of his friends, as general for the siege, giving him five thousand infantry and one thousand cavalry, while he himself, the time being close at hand at which he had been ordered to return, made the march down to the sea with the rest of his army. 
While this was taking place, in Italy the Romans were charged on their war with the Samnites, and there were repeated raids through the country, sieges of cities, and encampments of armies in the field, for the two most warlike of the peoples of Italy were struggling as rivals for the supremacy and meeting in conflicts of every sort. Now the Roman consuls with part of the army had taken a position in the face of the encampments of the enemy and were awaiting an opportune time for battle while at the same time furnishing protection to the allied cities. With the rest of the army Quintus Fabius, who had been chosen dictator, captured the city of the Fregellani and made prisoners the chief men among those who were hostile to the Romans. These to the number of more than two hundred he took to Rome, and, bringing them into the forum, he beat them with rods and beheaded them according to the ancestral custom. Soon afterwards, entering the hostile territory, he took by siege Calatia and the citadel of Nola, and he sold a large amount of spoil but allotted much of the land to his soldiers. The people, since matters were progressing according to their will, sent a colony to the island that is called Pontia de I in Sicily, where peace had just been established between Agathocles and the Sicilians except the Messenians, the exiles of Syracuse gathered in Messini since they saw that this was the only city remaining of those that were hostile to the dynast, but Agathocles, who was eager to break up their group, sent Pasiphilus with an army to Messini as general, telling him in secret instructions what he should do. Pasiphilus, entering the region unexpectedly and gaining possession of many prisoners and much other booty, urged the Messenians to choose friendship with him and not be forced to seek terms in common with his bitterest foes. The Messenians, gaining hope of a bloodless termination of the war, expelled the Syracusan exiles and welcomed Agathocles when he came near with his army. At first, he treated them in a friendly manner and persuaded them to receive back the exiles who were in his army, men who had been legally banished by the Messenians. But then he brought together from Tormenium and Messini those who had previously been opposed to his rule and put them all to death, being no less than six hundred in number, for his intention was to wage war on the Carthaginians, and he was getting rid of all opposition throughout Sicily. When the Messenians had driven out of the city those non-citizens who were most favorably disposed to them and best able to protect them from the tyrant, and saw that those of their own citizens who were opposed to the dynast had been put to death, and when, moreover, they had been forced to receive back men who had been convicted of crime, they regretted what they had done, but they were forced to submit, since they were completely cowed by the superior power of those who had become their masters. Agathocles first set out for Acragas, intending to organize that city also in his own interest, when, however, the Carthaginians sailed in with sixty ships, he abandoned that purpose, but he entered the territory subject to the Carthaginians and plundered it, taking some of the fortified places by force and winning others by negotiation. While this was taking place, Deinocrates, the leader of the Syracusan exiles, sent a message to the Carthaginians, asking them to send aid before Agathocles should bring all Sicily under his sway, and he himself, since he had a strong army after receiving those exiles who had been driven out of Messini, dispatched one of his friends, Nymphodorus, with part of the soldiers to the city of the Centoropini. Although this city was garrisoned by Agathocles, some of its chief men had promised to betray it on condition that the people be given autonomy. But when Nymphodorus broke into the city by night, the commanders of the garrison, perceiving what had taken place, slew both the man himself and those who pressed fiercely on within the walls. Seizing upon this opportunity, Agathocles brought accusations against the Centoropini and slaughtered all who were thought to have been guilty of the sedition. While the dynast was thus engaged, the Carthaginians sailed into the great harbor of Syracuse with fifty light boats. They were able to do nothing more, but falling upon two merchant ships from Athens, they sank the ships themselves and cut off the hands of the crews. They had clearly treated with cruelty men who had done them no harm at all, and the gods quickly gave them a sign of this, for immediately, when some of the ships were separated from the fleet in the vicinity of Bretia, they were captured by the generals of Agathocles, and those of the Phoenicians who were taken alive suffered a fate similar to that which they had inflicted upon their captives. The exiles who were with Deinocrates, having more than 3,000 foot soldiers and not less than 2,000 mounted men, occupied the place called Galeria, the citizens of their own free will inviting them, and they exiled the followers of Agathocles, but they themselves encamped before the city. When, however, Agathocles quickly dispatched against them Pasiphilus and Demophilus with 5,000 soldiers, a battle was fought with the exiles, who were led by Deinocrates and Philonides, each in command of a wing. For some time the conflict was evenly balanced, both of the armies fighting with zest, but when one of the generals, Philonides, fell and his part of the army was put to flight, Deinocrates also was forced to withdraw. 
Persephilus killed many of his opponents during the flight and, after gaining possession of Galeria, punished those guilty of the uprising. Agathocles, on hearing that the Carthaginians had seized the hill called Acnemis in the territory of Gela, decided to fight them to a finish with his whole army. When he had set out against them and had drawn near, he challenged them to battle since he was elated by his previous victory. But the barbarians not venturing to meet him in battle, he assumed that he now completely dominated the open country without a fight and went off to Syracuse, where he decorated the chief temples with the spoils. These are the events of this year that we have been able to discover. When Simonides was archon in Athens, the Romans elected to the consulship Marcus Valerius and Publius Decius. While these held office, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Lysimachus came to terms with Antigonus and made a treaty. In this, it was provided that Cassander be general of Europe until Alexander, the son of Roxanne, should come of age, that Lysimachus rule Thrace, and that Ptolemy rule Egypt and the cities adjacent thereto in Libya and Arabia, that Antigonus have first place in all Asia, and that the Greeks be autonomous. However, they did not abide by these agreements, but each of them, putting forward plausible excuses, kept seeking to increase his own power. Now Cassander perceived that Alexander, the son of Roxanne, was growing up and that word was being spread throughout Macedonia by certain men that it was fitting to release the boy from custody and give him his father's kingdom, and, fearing for himself, he instructed Glaucias, who was in command of the guard over the child, to murder Roxanne and the king and conceal their bodies, but to disclose to no one else what had been done. When Glaucias had carried out the instructions, Cassander, Lysimachus, and Ptolemy, and Antigonus as well, were relieved of their anticipated danger from the king, for henceforth, there being no longer anyone to inherit the realm, each of those who had rule over nations or cities entertained hopes of royal power and held the territory that had been placed under his authority as if it were a kingdom won by the spear. This was the situation in Asia and in Greece and Macedonia. In Italy the Romans with strong forces of foot and horse took the field against Politium, a city of the Maricini. And they also sent some of their citizens as a colony and settled the place called Interamna. A. In Sicily, where Agathocles was constantly increasing in power and collecting stronger forces, the Carthaginians, since they heard that the dynast was organizing the cities of the island for his own ends and that with his armed forces he surpassed their own soldiers, decided to wage the war with more energy. Accordingly, they at once made ready 130 triremes, chose as General Hamilcar, one of their most distinguished men, gave him 2,000 citizen soldiers among whom were many of the nobles, 10,000 men from Libya, 1,000 mercenaries and 200 Zagipi from Etruria, 1,000 Balearic slingers, and also a large sum of money and the proper provision of missiles, food, and the other things necessary for war. After the whole fleet had sailed from Carthage and was at sea, a storm fell suddenly upon it, sank sixty triremes, and completely destroyed two hundred of the ships that were carrying supplies. The rest of the fleet, after encountering severe storms, with difficulty reached Sicily in safety. Not a few of the Carthaginian nobles were lost, for whom the city instituted public mourning, for it is their custom, whenever any major disaster has befallen the city, to cover the walls with black sackcloth. Hamilcar, the general, gathered together the men who had survived the storm, enrolled mercenaries, and enlisted those troops of the Sicilian allies who were fit for service. He also took over the forces that were already in Sicily and, having attended to all things expedient for war, mustered his armies in the open country, about 40,000 foot soldiers and nearly 5,000 mounted men. Since he had quickly rectified the misfortune that he had suffered and won the reputation of being a good general, he revived the shattered spirits of his allies and presented no ordinary problem to his enemies. As Agathocles saw that the forces of the Carthaginians were superior to his own, he surmised that not a few of the strongholds would go over to the Phoenicians and also those of the cities that were offended with him. He was particularly concerned for the city of the Gelones since he learned that all the forces of the enemy were in their land. At about this time, he also suffered a considerable naval loss, for at the straits twenty of his ships with their crews fell into the hands of the Carthaginians. Deciding nevertheless to make the city of Gela secure with a garrison, he did not venture to lead an army in openly lest the result be that the Gelones, who were looking for an excuse, forestall him and he lose the city, which provided him with great resources. He therefore sent in his soldiers a few at a time as if for particular needs until his troops far surpassed those of the city in number. 
Sunni himself also arrived and charged the Jalones with treason and desertion either because they were actually planning to do something of this sort or because he was persuaded by false charges made by exiles or again because he wished to gain possession of wealth and he slew more than 4,000 of the Jalones and confiscated their property. He also ordered all the other Jalones to turn over to him their money and their uncoined silver and gold, threatening to punish those who disobeyed. Since all quickly carried out the command because of fear, he gathered together a large amount of money and caused a dreadful panic among all who were subject to him. Being thought to have treated the Jalones more cruelly than was proper, he heaped together in the ditches outside the walls those who had been slain, and, leaving behind in the city an adequate garrison, he took the field against the enemy. The Carthaginians held the hill Echnemus, which men say had been a stronghold of Phalaris. Here it is reported that the tyrant had constructed the bronze bull that has become famous, the device being heated by a fire beneath for the torment of those subjected to the ordeal, and so the place has been called Echnemus because of the impiety practiced upon his victims. On the other side Agathocles held another of the strongholds that had belonged to Phalaris, the one which was called Phalarium after him. In the space between the encamped armies was a river, which each of them used as a defense against the enemy, and sayings from earlier times were current that near this place a great number of men were destined to perish in battle. Since, however, it was not clear to which of the two sides the misfortune would happen, the armies were filled with superstitious fear and shrank from battle. Therefore, for a long time neither dared to cross the river in force, until an unexpected cause brought them into general battle. The raids made by the Libyans through the enemy's country aroused Agathocles into doing the same, and while the Greeks were engaged in plundering and were driving away some beasts of burden taken from the Carthaginian camp, soldiers issued from that encampment to pursue them. Agathocles, foreseeing what was about to happen, placed beside the river an ambush of men selected for courage. These, as the Carthaginians crossed the river in their pursuit of those who were driving the beasts, sprang suddenly from the ambush, fell upon the disordered soldiers, and easily drove them back. While the barbarians were being slaughtered and were fleeing to their own camp, Agathocles, thinking that the time had come to fight to a finish, led his whole army against the camp of the enemy. Falling on them unexpectedly and quickly filling up a part of the moat, he overthrew the palisade and forced an entrance into the camp. The Carthaginians, who had been thrown into a panic by the unexpected attack and could find no opportunity for forming their lines, faced the enemy and fought against them at random. Both sides fought fiercely for the moat, and the whole place round about was quickly covered with dead, for the most notable of the Carthaginians rushed up to give aid when they saw the camp being taken, and the forces of Agathocles, encouraged by the advantage gained in believing that they would end the whole war by a single battle, pressed hard upon the barbarians. But when Hamilcar saw that his men were being overpowered and that the Greeks in constantly increasing numbers were making their way into the camp, he brought up his slingers, who came from the Balearic Islands and numbered at least a thousand. By hurling a shower of great stones, they wounded many and even killed not a few of those who were attacking, and they shattered the defensive armor of most of them. For these men, who are accustomed to sling stones weighing Amina, contribute a great deal toward victory in battle, since from childhood they practice constantly with the sling. In this way, they drove the Greeks from the camp and defeated them. But Agathocles continued to attack at other points, and indeed the camp was already being taken by storm when unexpected reinforcements from Libya arrived by water for the Carthaginians. Thus again gaining heart, those from the camp fought against the Greeks in front, and the reinforcements surrounded them on all sides. Since the Greeks were now receiving wounds from an unexpected quarter, the battle quickly reversed itself, and some of them fled into the Himera's river, others into the camp. The withdrawal was for a distance of forty stades, and since it was almost entirely over level country, they were hotly pursued by the barbarian cavalry, numbering not less than five thousand. As a result the space between was filled with dead, and the river itself contributed greatly to the destruction of the Greeks. Since it was the season of the Dog Star and since the pursuit took place in the middle of the day, most of the fugitives became very thirsty because of the heat and the distress caused by the flight and drank greedily, and that too although the stream was salt. Therefore no fewer men than those killed in the pursuit itself were found dead beside the river without a wound. In this battle about five hundred of the barbarians fell, but of the Greeks no less than seven thousand. Agathocles, having met with such a disaster, collected those who had survived the rout and after burning his camp withdrew into Jela. 
after he had given it out that he had decided to set out quickly for Syracuse, three hundred of the Libyan cavalry fell in with some of the soldiers of Agathocles in the open country. Since these said that Agathocles had departed from Syracuse, the Libyans entered Gela as friends, but they were cheated of their expectations and shot down. Agathocles, however, shut himself up in Gela, not because he was unable to go safely to Syracuse, but because he wished to divert the Carthaginians to the siege of Gela in order that the Syracusans might quite fearlessly gather in their crops as the season demanded. Hamilcar at first attempted to besiege Gela, but discovering that there were troops in the city defending it and that Agathocles had ample supplies of all kinds, he gave up the attempt, instead, by visiting the fortresses and cities, he won them over and treated all the people with kindness, seeking to win the goodwill of the Sicilians. And the people of Camarina and Leontini, also those of Catana and Tormenium, at once sent embassies and went over to the Carthaginian, and within a few days Messini and Abyssinum and very many of the other cities vied with each other in deserting to Hamilcar, for such was the desire that came upon the common people after the defeat because of their hatred of the tyrant. But Agathocles conducted what survived of his army to Syracuse, repaired the ruined parts of the walls, and carried off the grain from the countryside, intending to leave an adequate garrison for the city, but with the strongest part of his army to cross to Libya and transfer the war from the island to the continent. But we, following the plan laid down at the beginning, will make Agathocles's expedition into Libya the beginning of the following book. End of Book 19